Hello, and a very warm welcome to everybody who's tuning in for this webinar. I'm Blaze from W Consulting, and most of you probably know us for our financial reporting updates and professional skills updates. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce a different update and one which I think is quite an interesting one, an interesting topic, uh, insofar as um, the nature of, of society today and the interest in social media. I'm very pleased to introduce Sandro Milo and Kyle Lamb from Eversheds, uh, who will be taking us through a seminar on social media and the law. So over the next three hours, you'll learn all about the perils of social media and how it impacts us and what we should take note of uh, as, we, as we make use of social media going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Blaise. Morning, everyone. My name is Sandro Milo. I'm an attorney specializing in employment law and civil litigation. I head Evershed Sutherland Attorneys South African Employment Law Practice. I have with me today Carl Lamb, a senior associate in my team. At the outset, we would like to thank W Consulting for bringing this exciting seminar to you and for inviting us to be a part of it. The law of social media, apart from um, being incredibly interesting and dynamic, is very important. We're all impacted in some or other manner by social media. Um, as employees of an organization, we often take to social media to support social causes, be it with a thumbs up or with added commentary. We might be against social causes and publish our views thereon. We may publish our opinions on political matters or social issues. We may even do something as seemingly innocuous as posting a picture of ourselves at the workplace on social media. And others in turn may comment on what it is that we post. Now, as a business owner or an employer, we often take to social media to publish stories or share information about our brand with the aim of increasing awareness about our business offerings and enhancing our brand and reputation. Um, as you know, others have the opportunity also to comment on what it is that we post. Additionally, the, the postings of our current employees and our former employees who, who may be disgruntled or disillusioned by the way they perceive we have treated them, very often also find their way onto social media. Um, additionally, consumers, clients, social justice warriors and anonymous parties may also comment upon our organisation, sometimes even anonymously, which may pose a serious risk to our brand, our reputation, or even the safety of our staff. And with all these things in mind, it's, it's, it makes it all the more important that individuals and business owners are aware of their le legal rights and obligations when publishing on social media or when embarking on any activity on social media, even such as liking a certain post. It's also important that individuals and employers are aware of their rights and obligations in regard to publications made by others which impact upon the uh, individual or the employer. But perhaps most importantly, it's imperative that people have an understanding of the steps that they can take and the remedies available to them in order to um, deal with any situation in which their rights or interests uh, may be at risk in the social media. So during this seminar, we intend providing you with very high level insights and guidance on all of these issues. Um, the impact of social media within the workplace has gained much judicial attention. And this is necessarily so when one considers that most individuals are either employees or business owners and postings more often than not impact that relationship between the employer and the employee. And it's therefore convenient to explore these general principles which apply to social media within the workplace, and that is going to be the focus of this seminar today. However, we do uh, extend beyond the workplace throughout this presentation. Just a quick disclaimer. Um, this wouldn't be a presentation presented by a lawyer if there wasn't a disclaimer. We, we are going to be presenting the law of general application, which cannot possibly take into account every conceivable variable which may alter the advice. And of course, um, you know, this presentation is no substitute for tailor-made advice. So if you find yourselves in a situation where you're dealing with a 
threat to your brand, to your reputation or the harm or, or the safety of your employees and other stakeholders, it's always preferable to obtain independent legal advice from a reputable attorney. Um, also, another disclaimer is that we will be presenting and discussing various social media postings made by various individuals which have garnered either media attention or judicial attention. And we do so for illustrative purposes and for learning purposes. Um, we in no means align ourselves in, with those tweets and the content of those tweets and the views expressed in that must in no way be considered to be the views that are held by us. Um, so the topics that we will be addressing in the session include the following. Um, what is social media? Um, we're going to be exploring, you know, the various platforms and and giving a very brief introduction to what is social media. We're going to be uh, presenting on the prevalence of social media in South Africa. It's important that you gain an insight on the extent to which it, it, it is used and by whom it is used in South Africa, because that will give you an indication of of the risks that it'll enable you to assess the risk that your organization may be may be exposed to just by virtue of the demographics. Um, the we then also intend speaking about the power of social media, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, an interesting point um, which we're going to be discussing is, you know, the importance of a social media policy and why it is that not all institutions have a social media policy. Um, we're going to present you with a case study. Um, one of our clients is a prominent university in Gauteng, and we intend um, presenting you with their social media uh, extracts from their social media policy for illustrative purposes. Not only will that demonstrate to you what should be in a social media policy, but it will also kind of bring together um, a comprehensive learning and understanding of all that has been presented thus far. And then very importantly, we're going to be um, um, closing on a general discussion on dealing with other social media uh, threats. So with that introduction, I'm going to hand over to my senior associate, Carl, who will be commencing with uh, and, and unpacking for you what social media is. Thanks very much, Sandro, for that uh, introduction, and thanks everyone for joining into the sim and this webinar, should I say. And I might start by just pointing out that when one looks at social media and compares it to traditional media, I think this seminar uh, typifies this webinar typifies that uh, we've gone from a seminar to a webinar where I can't see you, but you can see me and hear me. Um, but that's the new age we live in, and this is a, a, a part of the social media revolution and technological revolution um, that we have to learn to live with and adopt new ways to, to manage it. So at least on a more light-hearted note, I'll just take it that you aren't a tough crowd and <laughs> we can move through the presentation. So this, it's a perfect segue to, to mention, well, what is social media? And we all know it and we all use it and it can simply be described as a platform, um, a proverbial one at least, where people can gather together, they can communicate with one, each, with one another, they can interact and impart their ideas. But there's, there are significant differences between social media and traditional or conventional medias we've been used to in the past, such as newspapers and the like. And when we deal with traditional media, what we are used to is having professional journalists and editors who are aware of their rights and obligations and are schooled in those. Um, they vet their articles, they properly consider context, they will consider hopefully both sides of uh, the story and usually give a right of reply. And usually with traditional media, there's not worldwide publication in one click of a button. More than that, media, when an article goes out, it would, wouldn't ordinarily be intended for ongoing discussion and debate. It would be a one-sided publication for more inform informative purposes. Today, it's a bit different. Today, we have Twitter, we have Facebook, 
And we have millions of people around the world with access to whatever may be published at their fingertips. Um, and on top of that, the internet doesn't forget. We have a situation where people can get hold of things that were published many, many years ago and archived. And more than that, people can publish wherever they are, whenever they are. And everyone's a journalist today. And if one just ventures past a tweet into the comment section, where sometimes it descends into anarchy, uh, we get to see that, that it's not uh, simply a, a one-sided publication, but ongoing debate ensues. And against that backdrop, and the case law that we'll discuss during the course of this uh, webinar, you'll note that the speed at which this uh, social media revolution has taken place has left not only businesses and employers and employees a bit in the lurch on how to address social media and to manage it for, for the good and the bad and the ugly in the workplace, but it's also our courts that have been left a little bit behind in having to develop the law and their approaches to dealing with social media. And this we have seen has resulted in often a reactive approach being taken as opposed to a proactive approach. And a proactive approach is something which that we will address later in the presentation. So without getting bogged down too much in a technical speak, and, and that's not something I would profess to hold out to, to be able to do with any great measure, but social networking services, such as your Facebooks, your Twitters, they create a platform for people to interact with each other, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, to renew contact with friends, to be able to communicate across the world with relative ease. And as a result of that, one needs to have an identifier, a profile. And it's usually a personal profile that will identify who you are, your name, your background, and that kind of thing. Uh, with LinkedIn, for example, which is one uh, social media platform I'm sure many of you are familiar with, there you have to identify who your employer is, who your past employers uh, were, um, where did you go to university. So it does start to bed down a bit of who you are in the digital world um, as a reflection of who you are in the physical world. Not only that, there are private communications that are allowed and enabled through social media for friends and the like, but to it creates an environment for public debate where your activities are made public. We list below some simple examples and, and ones that you'll be familiar with um, of social media platforms, with usually the most popular ones being Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. But one ought not to forget that WhatsApp uh, and Messenger applications likewise are social media platforms. Um, and what is said on there, even what seems one would think is private, can easily be shared and spread across the world. So it's useful to get a, a, for a bit of contextual purposes, to get the idea of what the prevalence is of social media in the world um, by looking at not only South Africa, but beyond. Um, and we'll do a, a little statistical overview for you. So just starting with some global rankings, we have Facebook uh, here as um, ranked at two and a half billion users in the world. Uh, to put that in perspective, at this point in time, 2021, there's 7.9 billion people on the, on the planet, which gives you a percentage that 32% uh, of the world's population uses Facebook. Um, I, I need not venture into the other social media platforms. I, I, I take it that Facebook is quite far ahead because it had a bit of lead time uh, into the market when uh, social media came out in about 2007. In South Africa, um, I apologize, I realize that that slide may not have been up for you to see. I'll hold it there for a moment. Um, but I will move on and, and say in South Africa, uh, Facebook is likewise the most popular social media uh, application, with this year there being approximately 23.7 million people who use it. That's, that's nearly 24 million, almost up from 1 million last year. Um, when you factor into account our population, which sits around the 60 million mark, that's again is just over a third of our population who are on social media. And that's not the end of the matter. 
the projection is quite high. It's anticipated that over the coming years, there's going to be quite a number of Facebook users joining. Um, I need not read the slides, but if you look at 2025, it's anticipated that we'll see an increase of up to 26 and a half million uh, Facebook users in our country. And that's just Facebook. Uh, no doubt there'll be a bit of catch up in the other social media platforms that become popular and, uh, and used more often as we go along. And we have here an interesting uh, set of stats, which uh, is an age demographic um, of social media or Facebook users in particular. And you'll note here that most Facebook users are aged between uh, the age band 25 to 34. Uh, and that's often the age where uh, people come out of university uh, and they usually your job entrance into the market. And what is, is quite important is when people enter into the workplace, if they aren't aware, and they're the majority uh, users of uh, social media, of what consequences or their use of social media may mean for them and, and their employment, and likewise for their employer, uh, it could create problems for them. And, and a part of this presentation, we are going to be demonstrating that an education campaign is a helpful tool uh, to deal with uh, social media and its benefits and its risks in the workplace. So moving on to the power of social media, the good, the bad, and the ugly. One of our learned judge, judges in the South Gauteng High Court, Judge Willis, had this to say on the, the use of Facebook. Facebook is an instrument for spreading love, friendship, fun, and laughter around the world. It is incontestably a force of good. However, it's fought with its own dangers, especially in the field of privacy. And while Sandra will be commenting on that case here, it's prudent and a, a perfect segue into what the benefits, the benefits and risks are of social media. So benefits are quite far reaching. Uh, social media platforms are used in a variety of ways for employers. Uh, it's incorporated into business strategies. Uh, businesses have a, they're usually their own Facebook page and social media platforms. Uh, in order to market themselves and advance their presence in the work, in the market. Uh, it also has an economic um, trigger to it, in the sense that like buttons are routinely used by businesses to enhance their reputation. The more likes a business gets, the more popular they are, and hopefully for them, the more products or services they may sell. In addition to that, it also uses, uh, the like button can also be used as a signal that can be sent out into the marketplace to say, well, the product or your services are liked. Or if you're not getting likes, it might demonstrate, well, the market's not approving or receiving well um, your products or services and things need to give. Social media is used also by businesses for collaboration purposes. It gets, the, it gives the opportunity for employers to employees to feel that they are um, a part of uh, the family, that they are able to collaborate and, and cultivate new ideas and unleash intellectual capital um, amongst employees. In addition to that, it gives a, a, a softer sense of touch and a, an easier method of in, engagement by using social media as a form for improving customer experiences dealing with customer com complaints, uh, even in a relatively easy manner. And it has been shown that social media also enhances employee motivation and satisfaction. And this is the sense of belonging to which I just alluded. Um, social media can also be used as a product, an aid for product development and knowledge management in the workplace. And it can be used as an, a means to, to educate employees on the business uh, and what the business entails, what it stands for, what its policies are. And it facilitates recruitment. Um, in some cases, which we'll show has led to employees not being recruited or not being retained. Um, and it, is, it can also be used to staff or career progression, um, as well as <laughs> enhancing employability given one's social media presence and their value as an employee particularly in the, the football sphere as an example, 
uh, athletes that have a strong social media presence can usually use that to secure higher um, uh, salary packages and, and deals with uh, sponsors. But that being said, social media is not without its risks too. There's a study that was done in about 2012 uh, of US executives conducted by Deloitte and Forbes Insights. And there it was found that social media is the fourth largest risk um, that they suggested they would face amongst uh, global economic impacts and government spending and uh, regulatory control. Um, and added to this is the fact that negative or irresponsible postings that are, are, are done online have the propensity to travel around the world in a matter of seconds and have worldwide publication that can cause harm to the employer's pocket. Uh, indeed, it can also add uh, the added sting of harming the reputation of an employer, as well as undermining the image and reputation and career prospects of students and employees. And it's something to remember, and it's something that we'll demonstrate in this presentation, that not only does an employee's use of social media cause potentially cause harm if there are irresponsible postings, but also students, and these things can stick with you. We have uh, researched and found some data from Career Builder, and this was back in 2017, that indicates that most employers, and about 70% from the study conducted, uh, looked at an applicant's social media for purposes of selection. In more recent data from a different study, it seems that this number has increased to 90%. And we've also found in the study that over 50% of employers have been put off by applicants who've got inappropriate, evidence, uh, inappropriate photos, be it related to um, them participating in drinking or in alcohol abuse or any disparaging comments. And this is an appropriate place to look at an incident that happened at Harvard University. And, and this applies directly to students who were applying and in fact had their admissions, um, or in fact had their applications accepted and they were admitted to Harvard University. However, and you'll note from this posting that's on the slide, there was quite an insensitive posting that was published by these students in a, a group that they had, a private group, which found its way onto Facebook. Um, the context really was that there was a student who had died, uh, as we understand it, a, a Mexican stu a student, and they made a, a derogatory and uh, offensive remark that reads pinata time. Those students didn't appreciate, or prospective students I might say, didn't appreciate what this would do for them. When this uh, social media posting surfaced to Harvard, Harvard took a strong stance and they wouldn't associate themselves with students who hold these views, even if they thought it was a joke, it's not, it, it wasn't acceptable. And they in fact rescinded these students' applications to Harvard. And this is something that we've seen uh, with a number of universities and in fact with Harvard on more than one occasion where they have rescinded applications for or admissions of students on account of social media postings that have resurfaced years down the line. Another problem that uh, is uh, another risk with social media is that it's fraught with cyberbullying, and, and that's quite a hot topic that uh, has appeared from time to time. More than that, um, we have seen, and some of the case law to which we will refer shall demonstrate that social media is often used by employees as the incorrect platform to air and resolve their disputes. Uh, be it amongst their fellow colleagues or uh, line managers and the like. Uh, it also enables copyright infringement. Someone might see something, a picture that they like and think they should share it um, uh, and with, uh, with no restriction, um, or even you know, recording um, live games and streaming live football games or, or sports or events um, where they don't have the rights to do so. Uh, there are breaches of privacy and, and confidentiality that can occur with using social media. And we've seen examples where an employee thinks they are taking an innocuous selfie at work and included in the background of the photos a whiteboard 
with uh, private and confidential information of and concerning a deal that the employer may be concluding. Um, there's also the risk of uh, the publication of defamatory statements on social media. Uh, we do see that often uh, there are posts that are shot um, really off the hip um, and vicarious, li vicarious liability uh, is something that employers uh, must be uh, aware of and, and this really um, it is a theme later in the presentation where employees uh, commit some or other wrongful conduct and that wrongful conduct in law can be imputed to the employer. We have seen some interesting cases particularly in foreign jurisdictions where there have been an inadvertent conclusion of a contract uh, given the use of emoticons and emojis uh, over social media. Um, it also enables social, social media also enables the possibility of the participation in activities that constitute criminal acts um, and it may also be used to harass and cite uh, hatred and publish offensive material. Um, another issue is that uh, and I think this is an example of, of what I was just referring to. One of the uh, university clients that we have had a lecturer, and I'm, I'm going to scroll through some of these tweets, who uh, it was reported by a student had been engaging in inappropriate postings on, on social media, often concerning uh, the, the class and the students. Um, there were posts made by this lecturer that the institution was, was racist and there was white supremacy and so on and so forth. And in addition to that, there was also a tech um, by this lecturer on one of the students and that student's family. Um, with various offensive and defamatory statements made. Uh, this was dealt with, <laughs> there was no basis uh, and uh, the, the employee was called to a disciplinary hearing uh, to answer to allegations of defamatory um, uh, comments that were made and uh, because that was viewed as serious misconduct by the employer. And it transpired that the employee had no basis to, to raise these complaints in the first place. And during the course of that, that disciplinary hearing, um, there were various defences raised by the employees, such as, well, this was my, my own personal device, my own personal Twitter page that I was making these uh, statements on. I've got the right to freedom of, of speech. And those are defences that we will address later on in the presentation, um, but they didn't survive scrutiny in that case, and the employee was ultimately dismissed. I think everyone may remember the case of Penny Sparrow. Uh, this was a social media uh, posting on, on Facebook, which uh, was one of those social media postings that somewhat broke the internet in, in its own way. Um, and Penny Sparrow was an estate agent and she had, over the course of New Year's Eve, published a defamatory statement uh, and a racist statement. And she was ultimately called by the ANC to attend a the and involved in a legal suit in the Equality Court for hate speech um, in terms of the Equality Act. Um, and she didn't appear at court that day. I, I think there was also, there was a lot of pressure on her, but she, she didn't attend. Um, and the court there ultimately found that she was guilty of hate speech, uh, imposed a fine upon her, and also referred the matter to the Director of Public Prosecutions to look at instituting criminal proceedings. And Following that, criminal charges were brought against her on charges of criminal area, uh, which is really a, a criminal form of a criminalized form of hate speech, and uh, that's where one's dignity is impaired through racist slurs and the like. And, and that's something that Sandra will address uh, during his portion of the speech. Um, and she pleaded guilty to criminal area. Uh, she didn't face the criminal trial. She was also sentenced uh, to jail for it. Um, and she was the first person to be found guilty of criminal area, uh, as we know it, in, in the country. Um, so th that also seems to have put in motion uh, a hate speech bill that has been published, but not yet passed into law, um, because the judge in the Equality Court 
did suggest that there needs to be a statutory um, criminalization of, of hate speech. Moving on to the use of emoticons, a new beast. Uh, this is something we're seeing a, a bit more and more, uh, particularly in foreign jurisdictions, where the sending of a message with emoticons or emojis uh, can give rise to contractual arrangements of sorts. Here there was uh, an example that we found quite an interesting one at that. A couple were looking at a place to lease and a landlord uh, had shown an apartment that he had listed uh, to a couple and the couple sent these emoticons uh, to the landlord. Uh, you'll see people dancing, celebrating, the school that's found its nuts, so to speak, and they wanted, it, it seemed, to take the place. The landlord was trying to shore up this agreement, and admittedly this uh, was in Israel and, and subject to different laws than our country, but the landlord, uh, and the landlord removed the listing because he thought he had tenants. The tenant stopped responding to the landlord, um, and the landlord went to court and said, well, it seemed to me that they wanted to agree, or they did agree, uh, to take up the, uh, the apartment, and they were negotiating in bad faith. And the court there, based on the emoticons, really agreed with the landlord and awarded damages against the prospective tenants. So it's important to realize that emoticons themselves can provide context uh, to a situation. And this is something that should be taken into account by uh, employers and employees uh, and, and realize that the emoticons could have an impact on how posts are interpreted or received. Looking to the consequences of uh, irresponsible postings, these uh, consequences may differ for employees and employers alike. For employees, there's the risk of suspension uh, as well as prospective dismissal. And with that follows uh, psychological and reputational consequences potentially. Uh, that may arise from the suspension itself with colleagues knowing that you, know, you have been asked out of the workplace while an investigation is pending. Um, it will also see that employees from the case law more often than not are dismissed where they've made inappropriate postings or irresponsible ones. Um, in addition to that, the employee's own reputation and integrity is compromised and their employability may well be curtailed. Um, there's the risk that we've seen with Penny Sparrow uh, as an example that they may be exposed to criminal liability or, or even civil liability if they have been responsible for defaming someone. And the employee themselves uh, also expose their family to risks of retaliation. Uh, one only need to remember for a moment the Adam Castavalos scenario where he in Greece uh, made a, a video of himself on a beach on WhatsApp and uh, made various racial uh, racial slurs and sent it to a private group of friends and that video was leaked. And ultimately, we saw the boycotting of narc stores and threats to him and his family. So there is the risk of, of family retaliation. Uh, and bear in mind, an employee's social media is also a footprint um, from the days that they're a student. And this can uh, follow them uh, for wherever they go uh, and may obliterate any achievements that they achieve because, well, bad press usually gets the cover page. One incident, which is quite an interesting one, uh, was the Hargreaves Lansdowne incident. Now, this is a stockbroking firm based out in the UK, and there was an employee on the way to work, and he, he posted a tweet saying, I think I just hit a cyclist, but I'm late for work, so I had to drive off, lol. Now, this tweet surfaced and, and came to the employer's attention, and the employer was unhappy with it. He raised the defense of, well, I was just joking, I, I, I didn't mean for it to be serious. I, everyone who reads my Twitter page, they know that uh, it would just be a joke coming from me. The employer didn't share that sentiment and felt that it, it was associating itself with an individual, an employee, um, who would post offensive material. And they terminated his employment with immediate effect. So there is risks, even when one thinks that they're posting a tweet or uh, some kind of posting is being a light heart to gesture or simply a, a joke, that it will be received differently by others.
onto the point of uh, so social media postings hanging around with you. Uh, there's the example of Andre Gray. I, I know it's recorded here as an English Premier League uh, football player, but I uh, believe he is now in the championship, and I'm sorry for any Watford supporters that that may offend. Um, but the Football Association in 2016, while he was playing for Burnley, charged him with misconduct because it surfaced that in 2012 and or years prior that he had made various homophobic and uh, defamatory and offensive um, postings. And they fined him, sent him for sensitivity training, um, and suspended him from participating in several games for, for Bernie at the time. Uh, then there's also <laughs> the, the, and one of the themes that we'll explore is, you know, free speech, where, uh, and the, the expression of political opinions and views. We have Professor David Guth, uh, uh, University of Kansas professor, who at the time of a, a, a Navy Yard shooting in the US, posted, the blood is on the hands of the NRA. Next time, let it be your sons and daughters. Shame on you. May God damn you. Uh, this resulted in wide backlash and uh, outcry. And ultimately, Professor Guth was placed on immediate suspension. Um, while in investigations were afoot. We have Professor Jeffrey Miller, who also made a, a, posted a tweet saying, Dear obese PhD applicants, if you didn't have the willpower to stop eating carbs, you won't have the willpower to do a dissertation. Hashtag truth. Now, Professor Miller uh, tried to say that this was a part of uh, research that he was conducting um, and it was free speech. But again, this also caused outcry and for fat shaming. And ultimately, he was uh, at both universities because he was a visiting professor at another one in New York. Uh, he was subjected to disciplinary investigations. He had to go for sensitivity training. Um, he was removed from various committees that he, that he would ordinarily sit on. Um, he had to issue apologies and the like. Uh, so even one who thinks that they may post something frivolous or part of their research, or whatever it may be, runs risks uh, that there may be adverse consequences which they did not foresee. Uh, and one example I'll move, move over relatively quickly was the student Tatro, who, had, who was at the University of Minnesota. Now, Ms. Tatro used to use her diary, uh, or her Facebook, as her personal diary. Um, and she would, uh, in some instances, and in this instance in particular, comment on her daily affairs. And here at one point in her Facebook page said, I still want to stab a certain someone in the throat with the trocar. Um, and that we understand to be some kind of uh, scientific apparatus that's used to slice. Um, and she was in science class and this Facebook message came to one of her uh, peers, one of the students' attention. And they were worried about the safety of the lecturer because that's who they assumed was being referred to here. And Ultimately, there was an investigation by the university, the police were called in for safety concerns, um, and it resulted in her getting a failed grade uh, through a disciplinary process and having to go for ethical training and the like. And she took to court, saying, well, this is just satire. Everyone that knows me would know that it's my way of engaging on, online. And not, uh, I mean nothing by it or anything serious. And the court didn't agree. So these are the risks, and, and it's something that may hang around with the student when they want to be employed one day. And a, a more recent example is a Teen Vogue editor, uh, Alexi McCammond. She was meant to start working at Condé Nast Publications at the beginning of 2021 uh, in the position of editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue. However, many years ago, it, it surfaced that she posted homophobic and uh, racist tweets. Um, and that came up through internet users and was brought to the attention of her employer. And there was so much pressure from external parties uh, about these tweets. And, you know, does the company stand for this? Is, this? is this something they associate themselves with? And she agreed to part ways with the company. Um, and one interesting point of this that is worth pointing out is that the employer, in fact, knew about this. Um, and they thought, well, she's reformed herself over the years and become quite a renowned political uh, analyst who uh, speaks uh, with a voice for, um, for everyone. Um, 
But be that as it may, this wasn't how society received it. Um, and, and that is also a consequence that one should be aware of, that society's views may force the hand of the company on how they deal with its employees. But the consequences of irresponsible postings aren't limited to employees. It's also employers who may feel the effects of this. Often they're placed in an untenable position after an employer, uh, employee posts uh, something inappropriate. Uh, they may suffer harm uh, to their reputation and to their pocket. They may get, get backlash from not only their consumers, but the termination of sponsors. Um, financial backing may be withdrawn. Um, and if an employer has to discipline an employee, there are also the costs and the resources and time that is associated with disciplining or suspending an employee and ultimately fending off litigation down the line, uh, should they refer a matter to the CCMA, the Labor Court, or uh, alternative dispute resolution uh, forums. Of course, employers have to go through the recruitment exercise if they dismissed an employee. And, and try to find uh, further employment uh, and appointable candidates, which is an exercise um, of difficulty and expense. Employers inevitably have to uh, expend resources and adopt some kind of response to, to deal with an irresponsible posting. Um, there's also the legal risk that ensues where employees uh, post irresponsibly, and that's on the basis of vicarious liability. Now that's something that we should explore for a moment. Uh, vicarious liability, as I mentioned earlier, is where an employee posts something inappropriate, wrongful, um, and that co wrongful conduct is imputed to the employer because they've done it within what's known as the course and scope of their employment. Now there, the link it can happen outside the workplace. It can ha happen after hours. But if there's a sufficiently close link between the employee's misconduct and the business of the employer, vicarious liability may ensue. So what does this mean for the social sphere? There is an English case, which is quite an interesting one, and their employees uh, got hold of one of their colleagues' uh, phones uh, or the, and his password and got into his Facebook account and posted the status, finally came out the closet, I'm gay and I'm proud of it. And this status was posted during uh, working hours at the workplace and it concerned dealings between staff. And this employee uh, was offended by this. Uh, he felt that there was discrimination and he was differentiated and sexually harassed, in fact, um, on the grounds of his sexual orientation. And he lodged a claim in, in the UK uh, against his employer on the basis of principle uh, of vicarious liability and was successful. And those principles apply likewise in South Africa. There's also in South Africa the addition of the Employment Equity Act, which imposes obligations on the employer um, and really puts a form of liability on the employer where they fail to meet those obligations. So in circumstances where an employee raises a contravention uh, while at work of, of the Employment Equity Act by a fellow colleague, that conduct must immediately be investigated, uh, brought to the attention of the employer, and so that it can position the employer to take necessary steps. And that would include consulting relevant parties um, and taking steps that, that uh, as, as may be necessary to eliminate the alleged um, conduct, which may well be discriminatory in nature, and comply with the, the provisions of the Employment Equity Act. In the event that an employer fails to do so and to take the necessary steps, um, and it's proved that there is some contravention of the Employment Equity Act, be it discriminatory conduct by a fellow colleague, the employer will also be deemed to have contravened the section. And in that case, they may be held liable. An employer won't, however, be liable if the conduct of an employee is brought to the employer's attention and they're able to show that they've taken all reasonable practicable steps to ensure that there wouldn't be further misconduct or contraventions of the, the act to deal with the situation really. This was precisely the case, albeit not on social media, in the case of Liberty Group versus MM. And MM is used in order to uh, not identify the complainant in this matter. He complained of sexual harassment by her manager. 
she ultimately informed the employer that the sexual harassment was ongoing and the employer sat on its hands and did nothing. And damages of 250,000 Rand were awarded uh, to the complainant. The, the company appealed and said that it shouldn't be held liable, but the court found, well, you didn't do anything about this, you didn't act, and you didn't eliminate the, mis the, the sexual harassment, which in and of itself is a form of discrimination. Um, and uphold that damages was appropriate. Now, an interesting case is that of Esparta versus Richter and Oesterhazen. Now, a question that will arise in this case, and a principle which should be taken away from it, relates to, you know, what does an employer do if they tagged in a defamatory post? Or an employee for that matter, but they didn't draft the post and they didn't publish it. In this case, we have Esparta, who used to be married to Oesterhazen. They got divorced. Oosterhuizen got remarried to who is called the first defendant. Oosterhuizen is the second defendant. And the first defendant went on her Facebook page and posted uh, a series of Facebook posts, often concerning Oosterhuizen's former wife, Esparta, the plaintiff. Uh, in this post, she defamed um, who, uh, she defamed really Esparta. And it's, it's useful just to point out what defamation is. Defamation is the making of comments or the uttering of statements which are untrue and where they have the uh, tendency to lower the reputation of the person who's being uh, commented on uh, or being referred to. And the reputation is the esteem within which one is held by the right thinking member of society. Um, so in this case, what uh, Worst Hazen's new wife uh, uh, did is posted a, a few uh, posts, two of which were found to be defamatory. Um, the one really belittled the first wife uh, relating to her allegedly taking an unreasonable interest in the uh, first defendant's life. And the second one suggested that she condoned uh, uh, odd practices between her two children um, of a sexual nature and the like, which were all untrue. When before the court, the court said, well, they, one of the defences they raised was, well, you know, we, we think it's our Facebook page and we have the right to say what we want. And that didn't fly. And in addition to that, this was the first defendant's, first, uh, first defendant's uh, postings on Facebook. And she tagged her, her husband, the second defendant, in those posts. But he didn't take steps to remove himself from those posts. He knew about them and did nothing. And in that circumstance, uh, so in those circumstances, the court found that it's appropriate to find them as liable as the first defendant for making uh, defamatory statements. Um, so the useful principle to be to be learned there is where an employer or company comes to know of defamatory statements um, and they've been tagged in a, a post, for example, that is defamatory or uh, has racial connotations and the like, they should immediately take steps to dissociate themselves from those posts and do so actively. And more than that, there's also an important principle that comes about with defamation on, uh, in social media. And that's that, well, it's not just the posting itself, but the republication of a post, the forwarding of a post is its own act of defamation. So one might think that they've received something and they may simply forward it on or tag others in it without uh, any consequences, but that's not so. Um, and another principle to take away from this case and what the judge pointed out is that if they had apologized for the defamatory statements and made a public uh, apology that's of genuine, uh, that demonstrates genuine remorse, that would go away from, uh, go far away in mitigating damages to the plaintiff, acknowledging that they, what they said was wrong and untruthful. But in this case, they didn't do so, and damages were awarded against the defendants. Cancel culture is something that's come about and, and quite an interesting concept itself. Now, we don't take a political stance in any of these views, as uh, Sandra had mentioned in our classic lawyer disclaimer earlier, but we are highlighting some of the facts that employers should be aware of and should educate 
uh, their employees on. Uh, cancel culture is a modern term where people withdraw their support for a person or company because they've said something which may be construed as offensive or problematic. And people are cancelled, <laughs> as they term it, for this. And it's really a form of ostracism. One will remember the Tresemme scandal in 2020, where there was an advert that had gone out by um, uh, Tresemme uh, that uh, related, that, that was construed as having racial connotations to it. And Tresemme had to be pulled from all of click stores nationwide because there was a public outcry that um, the advert was racist. Um, Tresemme at the time didn't conceive it to be racist. Uh, they thought it ironically to be something which was inclusive. Um, but because of uh, public outcry and, and movement against it and the pressures of the EFF, a political party outside of the employment sphere, um, putting pressure on, on the employer, they ultimately pulled Tresemme products from the shelf and issued apologies. One of the, the first cases of the cancel culture was demonstrated by Justine Sacco. And she just was in uh, at Heathrow Airport. Uh, she was in the waiting lounge and she was going to South Africa at the time, uh, if I understand correctly, to visit her family. And while doing so in 2014, she posted, going to Africa, I hope I don't get uh, AIDS. Just kidding, I'm marked. Upon her arrival in Cape Town, she found out that she had been dismissed during her flight from her employer in the UK. So she barely had about 10 or 11 hours in the air. And during that time, given the rate at which this tweet spread, she didn't think it would uh, get the attention that it did. Uh, her employer immediately published statements when it came to its attention, distancing itself from uh, Ms. Sacco, and then ultimately terminated the relationship because they couldn't condone the conduct. So it begs the question, why do people publish these posts and if, if these are the risks that may eventuate? Some are clearly malicious and they intend to be uh, hurtful, uh, i.e. Penny Sparrow. Many regret their posts and are deeply apologetic after the fact. The Hargreaves Lansdowne incident uh, is an example of that, who you know, thought it was an accident. They were just trying to be funny. Um, the professors Guth and Miller, who we mentioned earlier, who commented on the National Rifle Association in the US and obese PhD applicants, they just thought, well, they, they apologize. And, you know, they thought, well, my Twitter account is private, and, but I do apologize for offense caused. Um, the, some wish to be funny. But a lot of the case law is evidence, and through our uh, experience, that many employees and people don't appreciate how widely the comments may be circulated and that it can go far beyond their initial audience. People, not, people often act hastily and shoot up uh, really off the hip um, and respond in short punchy ways without really reflecting on what it is that they're saying. Um, and studies reflect that people are underinformed of the consequences that they may follow from their postings. And that brings us to the necessity of a social media policy within the business sector. Um, if you can't unring the bell of irresponsible postings, it's more desirable to try to take proactive steps um, to prevent the posting in the first place. Um, and it's accepted uh, in studies and in the academic circles at least, that social media policy is probably the first step that a company can take in its responsible approach to dealing with social media issues and the consequences that arise from using social media. Um, in addition to that, a social media policy is not only serve to educate um, and guide and inform employees, but it also sets the standard for a company of what is acceptable use of social media. And in doing so, by adopting a social media policy, it may protect the company's reputation, can provide clarity on legal issues, uh, both for the company itself, uh, its staff and its custodians of the policy, but also for its employees. It may well uh, raise awareness of the company's brand and how social media may impact on a company's brand. And it can also assist in maintaining a global standard for global firms. So why is it that not all companies have the social, social media policy? So a, a study in 2014 
conducted on companies registered with the South African chapter of the Institute of Internal Auditors revealed that 72% of companies reported that social media is perceived to pose a risk to the organization. However, 35% of those companies uh, only had a social media policy, 48% did not, and 17% were unsure whether the company had a social media policy or not. And that suggests that it's something that may well not have been championed uh, by the organization or put in the drawer and forgotten. Um, and another study demonstrated that social media is classified as a lower risk of priority within those organizations that were surveyed. Um, and ownership and enforcement mechanisms of social, of social media are not quite understood. And that's a topic that uh, Sandra will address in due course when, when dealing with social media um, and the defenses raised and, and, and what actions employers can take and also how social media threats may be addressed. Another reason why social media policies may not be adopted is the notion of uh, one's constitutional right to freedom of expression. And if we have a social media policy, which in some or other way regulates how uh, individuals interact, it may have a chilling effect on the freedom of expression. And without further ado, I think it's time that I stop yapping for a bit and we have a break. So if you wouldn't mind, we'll um, take a break and uh, assess any questions that uh, you may have during this and, and return with our answers in due course. It's, 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 now, it's now half past one. Can I suggest that we resume at quarter to two? Thanks.
Hello everyone, and we're back from the break. Um, I'm just going to answer one of the questions that came through from Anonymous. Uh, it's quite an interesting question. It refers to the Harvard University incident. And the question reads as follows. Was everyone removed from the university who was in that group, even if a student didn't comment? Well, the short answer is no. Uh, there were over 100 members in the group. Um, but in fact, a handful of about 10 or so students uh, had their application, their admissions rescinded. Um, and those students were participants in sending uh, various offensive material. The uh, pinata time example that we provided was but one of those examples. Um, and then there's a second part to the question, which is also interesting. And that's, what is the risk if you're part of the group, but don't comment? Now, context is everything. And in a situation such as that, there were the members that we, who participated in the group, but didn't have their admissions rescinded. Um, and if you have good reasons for not commenting or staying silent and not supporting something, there are grounds to argue that, well, um, this is something that uh, I wasn't associating myself with. But again, we've seen the example with the defamatory statements uh, in that Esparta and Richter judgment, if you are tagged and you know about something and it's considered that you're associated with it, uh, there is the risk that you may be held just as liable. So it's something to be mindful of. But again, context is everything. Uh, and with that, I hand over to Sandra Mido again, who's going to continue with the next portion of the presentation. Thanks, Carl. Um, another question that we have is whether we're going to be making the slides available uh, to the participants at the end of the presentation. And yes, of course we will. Um, I'd also ask that you continue please to send in your questions. Um, we will keep a record of them. And at the conclusion of this presentation, we'll go through those uh, questions once again and, and answer them. So a lot of the, <sighs> Defenses that employees could possibly raise in response to social media um, interrogations and 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 comeback from the employer have been alluded to in the earlier part of the presentation. These defenses are sometimes also raised not only by employees themselves but also by people who who have perpetrated certain defamatory statements. And let's let's consider them. And the idea about considering these, you know, the idea is let's consider these these questions or these defenses rather, and then we can unpack them and see how an employer could, could be best suited towards dealing with them. Now, a very um, important or a very commonplace defense is, look, I have the constitution, constitutional rights to privacy. So if I've, sorry, there seems to be a technical issue. We're just trying to resolve. Sorry, it's been brought to my attention that our slides weren't, weren't displaying, so that's just been resolved. So some of the defences raised by employees and others is that, look, I have a constitutional right to privacy. What I post in my time is my business, and you, you as an employer or you as an external party, a third party, have no right to, to interfere in my privacy. Another um, common defense is I have the constitutional rights to freedom of expression. And you'll hear this, this defense mounted many, many, many times. Uh, people say I have a right to, to, to share my views on social media, to air my opinions. And, and who are you really to interfere in what I, in, in how I express my opinions? And, and they really bring both of these, these, these um, defenses under the banner of the constitution. Um, which, which um, you know, with the intention that this is going to, or the belief that this is going to protect their postings from scrutiny. And as we'll see, that's not the case. 
So these two constitutional rights generally um, are encapsulated in the in the statement. I use my own personal profile, my personal device, and on my own time. Um, another defense that we often see is, look, I did not mean what I typed. We've heard Carl mention several examples where employees or other individuals say, look, I intended to be funny. Um, often, often I didn't give much thought into what I was writing, or it's misconstrued. You're interpreting it incorrectly. The interpretation that I spin on it is, the, is what I meant. And who are you to say or interpret my message and to ascribe to it a certain meaning that I never intended to convey? That's, that's a defense that we see quite often. Another defense is, look, I apologize. My, my, my social media posting was, was, um, was, was live for, we'll see one case for a matter of only about two hours. And when the employer told me to take it down, I took it down. And, you know, no, there's no harm in that. And I, in addition, I apologize. The question is, is that enough? Is it enough to escape the consequences of, of the rights that you have violated in respect of somebody else? Another um, use, another common defense is, look, I was using social media to air a grievance. Um, to, I, I'm suffering in, from certain adverse conditions in my workplace, um, or more often, my workplace is in fact committing certain irregularities, um, which I don't have the confidence to share with people within my organization because I don't believe that they're going to uh, address this. I don't believe that they're going to uh, firstly take my concern seriously. And, and secondly, I fear retribution. So, you know, sometimes a posting can even be made anonymously. Um, but when these individuals are discovered, they say that, they, that their disclosures are what is known as protected disclosures. Now, we have an act, uh, an act of parliament, a piece of legislation, which prohibits any retribution to be taken by an employer against an employee who brings these um, irregularities perpetrated by the employer to light provided that that employee does so along the appropriate channels and is not and 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 um, does so with the proper intentions but but generally speaking where an employee raises these concerns in the appropriate light it's known as whistleblowing and they are protected so often what we find is that um, people um, use the defense of whistleblowing to try to protect themselves from any uh, adverse consequence that arises from, from their tweets. Now, in order to assess each of these defenses more carefully, which is important if you're going to understand how to protect yourself and your organization from the consequences of, of um, social media postings, it's important to understand the relevant and complete legal framework that applies in, this, in these circumstances. Um, there is a very interesting uh, decision by the uh, South Gauteng High Court, it's a High Court in Johannesburg, in the matter of H versus W. And in this case, and I'm going to talk to you about you know, the, the details of this case more fully when in, in another context later on. However, for, for, for the purposes of this uh, discussion, it's important, I think it's useful to read out what the court said. It said, look, we have ancient common law rights, both to privacy and to freedom of expression. These rights have been enshrined in our constitution. The social media have created tension for these rights in ways that could not have been foreseen by the Roman Emperor Justinian's legal team, the learned Dutch legal writers of the 17th century or the founders of our constitution. It is the duty of the courts harmoniously to develop the common law in accordance with the principles enshrined in our constitution. The phase of the march of technological progress has quickened to the extent that the social changes that result therefrom require high levels of skill, not only from the courts, which must respond appropriately, but also from the lawyers who prepare cases such as this for adjudication. What our courts in essence were saying in this judgment is that look, social media is a new phenomenon. The pace at which it is changing the world in which we live is unprecedented. However, we do have current law, old law, ancient law, that can be adapted, modified, and applied to deal 
with the exigencies of social media as it as it prevails. So with that in mind, it's important to, I think, consider that whenever we're assessing whether somebody has breached the law, we can always assess it against certain fundamental principles, ultimately which, which find expression in the Constitution, and then we can look at any particular piece of legislation which may assist. So what most of you may probably be aware of is that our Constitution, which, which first appeared in 1993, is really the Supreme Court, the Supreme Law of South Africa. It is, it sets out the foundational principles against which all other laws and all other conduct must be assessed. So it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a very important piece of legislation. Um, section 10 of the Constitutional speaks specifically about human dignity. And it provides that everyone has inherent dignity and the right to have their dignity respected and protected. What we find is that when people publish posts in the social media which tarnish or infringe the dignity of, an, of somebody else, that person is violating the other person's human dignity, and that is a violation of their constitutional right. Another important right set out in the Constitution is that relating to privacy. It says everyone has the right to privacy, which includes the right not to have, and I'm reading the fourth bullet point, the privacy of their communications infringed. The right to privacy is used in two ways when dealing with social media infringement. It's, it's used often by the person who is publishing the post. You know, they may say that they had the personal settings on Facebook and other social media platforms set to private. And to the extent that somebody has, has, has obtained copies of their private postings, um, that is an invasion of their privacy, which, which should bring matters to a halt there. They should not um, that evidence should not be used against them in any subsequent proceedings. They also contend that they have the rights, in terms of their constitutional rights to privacy, to share in a private sphere, in private being 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 uh, a, private being you know a, a fairly subjective assessment. But with people within their their close sphere of private friends, they believe that they have the rights to share their views in a private manner, and to the extent that there are breaches of that. That, that constitutes a violation of their rights to privacy, which should not be tolerated. So where you have, um, to use the example that Carl mentioned earlier, where you have the example of somebody sending a, a an inherently racist video um, to a group of private individuals and that and somebody within that group on sends that video to others, um, the argument is often raised that was a violation of my right to privacy. That is something I didn't condone, and therefore I should be shielded from any 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 uh, further uh, retribution or sanction because because that evidence should not be used. It was it was improperly obtained. Conversely, um, we also see that this right to privacy is used by the victims of postings. We've seen examples, um, um, you know. Uh, We've seen examples in the Sparta decision, and we'll also speak about the H versus W decision, um, which I quoted from earlier on, where people post, make postings in, you know, in a public space of and concerning somebody who I will call the victim just for convenience. And that victim has their private affairs displayed publicly. And they're saying, and the argument is, that publication violates my constitutional right to privacy. As we've seen, the, the, the a favoured argument for publishing freely is the right, the constitutional right to freedom of expression. Now, section 16 of the constitution expressly provides that people have the constitutional right to freedom of expression. Um, freedom of expression extends to freedom of the press and other media, which I think is precisely what we're discussing today. 
Um, the freedom to receive or impart information or ideas, the freedom of artistic creativity, and academic freedom and freedom of scientific research. So whilst academic, whilst freedom of speech is without question a fundamental human right, it is not considered a paramount right. And I say this because this is one of the few constitutional rights that have embedded within this right certain limitations and restrictions. Section 16.2 of the constitutional of the constitution points out that this right, being this right to freedom of expression, does not extend to propaganda for war, incitement of imminent violence. Now, often what we see in social media um, um, postings, and often quite we see quite aligned with this cancel culture phenomenon, is an incitement of of imminent violence. And what the Constitution itself points out is that that type of, of posting or that type of expression does not enjoy constitutional protection. Also, what we see highly pertinent to the topic under consideration is freedom of expression does not extend to the advocacy of hatred that is based on race, ethnicity, gender or religion, and that constitutes incitement to cause harm. So there are two elements here in um, to this limitation to the constitutional rights to freedom of expression. What the constitution says is that it does not extend to any advocacy for hatred. If that advocacy is based, or if that ha hatred is based on any of these prohibited grounds. But there's a second element that must also be present. It must also be considered that this expression or this expression or this publication, in addition to constituting an advocacy of hatred, also constitutes an incitement to cause harm. What a lot of people are unaware of is that at the end of the Bill of Rights section in the Constitution, there's a section 36 entitled the Limitation Clause. And what this clause does quite broadly is um, it, it's a limitation clause of general application. It limits um, the ambit of the freedom of, of, of any of the fundamental freedoms and rights set out in the Bill of Rights. And I say it's a law of general application because as we've seen um, in the freedom of expression right, it has embedded within it its own limitation, whereas section 36, the limitation of clause applies to all of the fundamental rights in the Constitution. And, it's, and it's, it specifically provides that any of, the, any of the rights in the Bill of Rights can be limited but only in terms of a law of general application. And if that limitation is reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality and freedom, taking into account all relevant factors. Well, I just want to pause at this junction to point out that you will see even in the limitation clause, the very, very first thing that, well, the very first item that the limitation clause says we must take into account is effectively human dignity. And as we will see, although there's no official ranking of, of rights, we see that human dignity is one of those constitutional rights that do seem to enjoy primacy over other rights. So some of the factors that need to be taken into account would be the nature of the right, the importance of the purpose of the limitation, the nature and extent of the limitation, the relation between the limitation and its purpose, and whether there's any less restrictive means to achieve to achieve that purpose. Now, now, what does this all mean? Perhaps the best way to explain this is to is to consider an example. The reason why there will always be a need to allow for certain constitutional rights to be limited is because very often and in fact, most constitutional court decisions rest or, or relate to matters where there is a competing sense, where, where there, there are two constitutional rights that compete with one another. So, for example, to use the example, you know, relevant to social media, you have an individual's right to freedom of expression. And let's assume the posting is one that does not, is not limited by the general limitation, or what by the, the limitation within the within the limitation clause. So it may not be something that necessarily advocates hatred and 
in, an incitement towards violence. It may be hurtful, it may be offensive, it may impair the human dignity of somebody else. So then you can immediately see that there's an inherent conflict between constitutional rights. Somebody's constitutional rights to freedom of expression as, com as, as compared and, and, and ought to be balanced against another person's constitutional rights to human dignity. And when these two rights are assessed against one another, very often you would need to limit one of these rights. And the way one does that is through this exercise. And, and, and what one would seek to do is to consider, for example, and I'm going to speak very broadly and generally here, if somebody's posting a hurtful tweet, say on one of these social media platforms, you would need to look right, what is the nature of the right? Well, it's, it's, it's a freedom of expression, that much is pretty clear. But what are we saying? Are we saying that you can't express your right to freedom of expression? Well, no, we're not saying that. We're saying that you can only do so in a manner that does not infringe the human dignity of somebody else. And therefore, applying the limitation clause, we would be able to say quite confidently that the importance of the limiting the person's rights to freedom of expression is in order to safeguard the rights of the other party to human dignity. We would also look to see, you know, um, what is the relation between the limitation and its purpose? And well, the purpose really is to is to safeguard somebody's human dignity and the limitation is not so severe. They are less restrictive. Um, it, it's not it's not so severe such that that person's right to act to uh, freedom of expression is completely squashed and that's the way one needs to do it and one needs, needs to consider it so effectively and in sum what we're looking at is a balancing of rights we have a specific piece of legislation which which um, it's called the promotion of equality and the prevention of unfair discrimination act which i'll refer to as papuda which is also geared towards towards uh, um, prohibiting any form of unfair discrimination and it also speaks about hate speech. Now what's important to note is that discrimination is prohibited in the employment context in the Employment Equity Act. So if, if an employee feels that he or she is being discriminated against by the organization, by the employer, uh, they could bring a claim in terms of the Employment Equity Act, not in terms of Papuda. But Papuda governs and prohibits any form of unfair discrimination in spheres outside of the employment context. And that's not really directly relevant for the purposes of today's discussion. What is relevant, however, is that there is a section in this legislation which prohibits hate speech. And let's, let's, let's look at that. So section 10 of the act provides an express prohibit, prohibition on, on hate speech. And it's worthwhile reading, reading in context, and I'll pause to comment where necessary. Section 10 sub one of this act provides that, subject to a certain proviso, which we'll address, no person may publish, propagate, advocate, or communicate. And we can see the, just in terms of the broad ambit of this definition, this would include obviously people publishing on social media. On any one, um, so they may not communicate words based on one or more of the prohibited grounds against any person that could reasonably be construed to demonstrate a clear intention to be hurtful, be harmful, or to incite harm, promote or propagate hatred. The Act goes on to state that without prejudice to any remedies of a civil nature under this Act, the Court may, in accordance with this another section, refer any case dealing with the publication, advocacy, propagation or communication of hate speech as contemplated uh, in the section to the Director of Public Prosecutions having jurisdiction in order for criminal proceedings in terms of the common law or relevant legislation to be instituted. I'm just going to unpack that a little bit for you because I realize that there's a lot that has been said. So insofar as hate speech is concerned, this act establishes certain equality courts. And if there's an infringement um, of any of this piece of legislation, and we can see that some of the social media postings would fall within this, within this ambit, uh, within the ambit of this legislation, somebody can refer the matter so the victim of, of that 
um, posting or even a group of people. So, you know, if there's a, if there's a racist comment directed at a particular segment of society, that group itself could institute proceedings in an equality court in terms of Papuda. And ultimately, what the outcome of that could be some kind of a some kind of a damages claim that could be could be meted out, as we've seen in in in, in the Penny Sparrow case. That's that's where this matter originated. But then the Act goes on to state that what what the what the Equality court, Courts can do in addition to that is to refer the matter for possible criminal prosecution in terms of the common law or in terms of any legislation which would which would warrant some kind of a criminal proceeding. Now, our common law and our common law has long since recognized a notion of what is known as crimen in urea. Um, crimen in urea really consists in the unlawful and intentional violation of the dignity of another person in such circumstances where that violation is not of a trifling nature. Um, and this is a crime. It is not a crime that is generally prosecuted because of the specific nature of, 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 of the elements of this crime. One need, would need to demonstrate that there was an intentional violation of somebody's human dignity and that that violation is not of a trifling nature. So it needs to be a very, very serious form of, 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 of uh, a violation of somebody's human dignity. We've not seen this, this this uh, this remedy or this crime being prosecuted with any degree of alacrity in the country. And that is probably why, um, uh, I'll get to that, that is probably why our courts, uh, our, our parliament has sought to enact another piece of legislation which, which criminalizes hate speech in a more holistic way. And, I, and I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. So to illustrate some of these points, I'd like to refer you to, to a decision of Dagane versus SS, SBC and others. Now, the facts of this matter are the following. So um, there was a member of the South African Police Service who uploaded racist comments on, the, on his Facebook page regarding Jim, Julius Malema. Um, and effectively, he seems to have been calling for genocide. He seems to be, um, he's advocating hatred. Now, notably, the, the SAPS did not have a social media policy and at the time. And the important point to glean from this is, although throughout this presentation we keep speaking about the importance of having a social media policy, and there are massive benefits to having so, which, I will, which I'll address you know, more fully later on. The fact that one does not have a social media policy does not, does not um, mean that you, 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 you can, an employer cannot take action against somebody for um, a post of, of this nature. And what, what we found in this case is that the court found that the employee's racist comments were deplorable and the issue of whether or not freedom of speech could be used as a defence um, was considered by the court and the court said no, it's not protected by freedom of, 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 of um, expression. Another case uh, dealing with the, the balancing of constitutional rights and the prohibition set out in Papuda and so forth found its way to the, to the High Court and then ultimately to the Supreme Court of Appeal. So this is a court um, of, of, of superior status to the, high, to the High Court. And this matter concerned Hots versus the University of Cape Town and, and the decisions of, of the Supreme Court of Appeal is in fact quite telling and useful in this context. It's, it says that in guaranteeing freedom of speech, the Constitution, also, the Constitution also placed limits upon its exercise. Where the exercise of a right goes beyond a passionate expression of feelings and views and becomes the advocacy of hatred based on race or ethnicity and constituting incitement to cause harm, it oversteps those limits and loses its constitutional protection. Effectively, the court was saying that advocacy of hatred, hate speech, is not protected by the Constitution. There is a mention that, we, we, you know, we've seen how Papuda places a prohibition on hate speech, but it, it, it provides a similar rem remedy and it, and it effectively also encourages 
violations of Papuda to be reported to, to, the, to the prosecuting authority to consider whether and to what extent common law or other pieces of legislation could be used in order for criminal proceedings to be instituted. So there was clearly a gap in the legislation. And this prompted our parliament to enact um, the, oh, sorry, our parliament to, to place for consideration in parliamentary debate a bill. And this bill is called the Prevention and Combating of Hate Crimes and the Hate Speech Bill. It has been published on the 29th of March, 2018. It is still not yet made its way into law, but it's useful to consider this bill because it is likely to be to find its way into as an act of parliament as a piece of legislation by which we're legally obliged to comply and in any event it also reveals i think the thinking that that we may see or that we have seen and we will continue to see that applies throughout judicial assessments of of social media infringements and the like notably here we have um in, in this bill Hate speech will be criminalized in very, very broad terms. Um, if anybody publishes, publishes, propagates or advocates for hate speech, that will be considered to be a criminal offense. If anybody distributes or makes available in an electronic form any hate speech, then that person will also be guilty of a criminal offense. And, and what, what the bill explains um, in the wording of the bill itself, but also if one reads the commentary and the objectives of the bill, which was published alongside the bill, it's intended to cater to situations precisely like the example that that was mentioned earlier on. If there is a piece of, if, if there is, if there is a an element of hate speech in perhaps a a video that is being circulated or a posting that is being forwarded, each person who forwards that post. If they know that what they're forwarding, or if they reasonably ought to know what they're forwarding constitutes hate speech, then that person will also be guilty of a criminal offence. Um, no person may also display any hate speech. Look, there are exceptions to this, exceptions relating to artistic integrity and scientific research and so forth. But, but, but you know, generally speaking, this, is, this would not be allowed. For the first time we have within the legislation, uh, mechanisms to acknowledge the severity of emotional and psychological impact of hate crimes. The bill, the bill speaks about requiring a victim statement to be presented to court for a victim or a, or, or a member of a group who are victims to place their thoughts before the court in, in, in how the, the, the offence has impacted them. Um, It expressly covers electronic communication, electronic representation and communication by means of data messages, which is incredibly broad and it covers all the platforms and messengers which we've discussed previously. Quite importantly, is that the definition of victim is, 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 has been set to expressly include a juristic person where appropriate. So a juristic person would be a company. So a company itself could when this when this bill um, is enacted um, could also seek the protection of this of this legislation and the criminal sanctions in the in this in the bill in its current state would be for a period of uh, uh, three years um, imprisonment and fine on first offense or five years imprisonment and a fine thereafter so this, this law, once enacted, will have far-reaching consequences for society as a whole, including businesses. Um, and, and a theme which, we, which, I've tried to, which we've tried to get across throughout this presentation is that companies and employers therefore need to be encouraged to educate their employees on the purpose and the impact of the bill and possible criminal uh, sanctions that ma might arise from, from hate speech. The question that I'm, I'm often asked to consider is, well, what about irresponsible posting that does not constitute hate speech? And this, again, can be in the context of an employee who's posted against his employer or fellow employees, or it could be in the context of, as we saw in, in the Esparta case, where somebody posts, makes, posts a comment that is simply defamatory, but it doesn't reach the mark where it constitutes hateful speech and it, or criminal in your its crime. Well, as we've seen, the first thing to do is to consider a balancing of competing rights. 
And we will always have to see that the rights of freedom of expression would need to be balanced against these other rights, which I've mentioned. What I also wanted to point out is that a lot of what a lot of people are not necessarily aware of is that employees have certain common law obligations. So, you know, regardless if the contract of employment is silent on the duties of an employee, and regardless of whether or not there's a policy in place setting out the rules of conduct, um, employ an employer will always be entitled to rely on certain common law obligations that employees have. And these obligations include the, the, the duty to promote and protect the interests of his employer or her employer. Um, the common law also places a positive obligation on employees um, of trust and confidence with his employer. Um, the obligation to act with the utmost good faith towards his employer the duty to act with care and skill towards the employer and, and not to cause disharmony in the workplace. You can immediately see that if one just considers these common law obligations that employees have, if they publish defamatory statements against their employer or against a client of the employer, or if they if they make certain postings, as we saw with the woman who was who was dismissed on her on the way to you know on her flight to South Africa for that posting which she made, you know the the reason for that is because there's often a backlash. There's often it places the employer into disrepute, and the moment somebody makes these postings which are questionable and problematic, that employee is violating all of their the their common law obligations which may exist in addition to any any rules and policies which the employer has specifically you know put in place to address this um, just to to wrap up on the the legal framework before analyzing the defenses more fully i'd like to 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 mention what our court said in this in the anti versus sparrow penny sparrow case while recognizing that that uh freedom of expression is fundamental the Constitutional Court has held that it was not a preeminent right ranking above all others, nor is it an unqualified right which automatically trumps the right to human dignity, and it does not enjoy superior status in our law. The right to dignity is a core fundamental human right. And, and you know, I, I've already pointed out that you know our courts have, have tried to steer away from saying ranking rights, but, but what's quite clear in in the judicial pronouncements that have thus far come about, in Papuda, in the Employment Equity Act, and in this uh, prohibition on hate speech bill, is that where there is a conflict between somebody's right to human dignity and somebody's right to freedom of expression, it's it's whilst context is everything, and there will be exceptions. It's more likely than not that the person's right to to human dignity and privacy will trump the, the, uh, the uh, his or her counterpart's right to freedom of expression. The right to privacy um, was was given an, an, a nice uh, take in, in the Constitutional Court decision of Kumalo versus Holomisa. And here the Constitutional Court said that the right to privacy recognizes that human beings have the right to a sphere of intimacy and autonomy that should be protected from invasion. And this right to privacy serves to foster human dignity. So here the court was saying that the right to privacy is necessary to protect because that in and of itself fosters human dignity. Um, I told you that I would speak about the case of H versus W and I'm, and I'm going to address, I'm going to, I'm going to do so. So here, quite similar to the Esparta judgment, we have a dispute between H and W. So here what happened was W published a posting on Facebook entitled a letter to W, being the applicant, for public consumption, which was highly defamatory and suggested that um, um, the applicant was a drug addict who did not care for his children. You can immediately see how the applicant may have been very, very concerned about this. Um, the, the, the applicant asked the respondent to remove the posting from the social media uh, pace, but the respondent refused to do so. So what, what the applicant did in that case was the applicant approached the High Court to seek an interdict. An interdict um, can be an interdict to prevent somebody from doing something 
or it can be what is known as a mandatory interdict, which is an interdict in order to compel somebody to do some something. And here, the applicant approached the High Court saying, I want an order compelling, I want you to make an order compelling the respondent to remove this, this very, very defamatory and problematic uh, post. The court then had to grapple with these issues as we've discussed, freedom of expression, human dignity, privacy, and, and so forth. And um, the court once again affirmed that there's a close link between human dignity and privacy. Um, the court here viewed that the applicant's rights to privacy and human dignity were being infringed in this post. It also considered, you know, what legitimate purpose was the respondent serving in placing this letter for public consumption. And the court said that there was no legitimate purpose for that. Um, the court was mindful that, look, if, you, if it's going to start issuing interdict, calling upon people to remove posts, it may have a chilling effect um, on, on, on the public's general willingness to, to post on social media. The chilling effect effectively means, look, if I know that there may be some kind of retribution, I might actually be too fearful to exercise my rights to freedom of expression and so forth. And whilst that's always going to be a concern, our court pointed out that, look, that can be managed. And, and if people are just, just act responsibly and are called to task, nobody is saying that you shouldn't exercise your right to freedom of expression, but you can only do so in within certain parameters. And this is nothing new. These parameters and limitations have, have existed way back, even before the Constitution found its form. Um, in this case, um, which is something that's not surprising, the court found that the applicant's right to privacy and dignity trumped the respondent's right to freedom of expression. Um, for those of you who have may, be, may have been involved in trying to obtain an interdict, um, you will know that one of the requirements to obtain an interdict is that there must not be a suitable alternative remedy. Because the idea is that if you have a suitable alternative remedy to an interdict, you should rather follow that and you should rather be, you know, invoke that remedy because it's recognized that, you know, to compel somebody to do something is, is somewhat invasive. Um, here, another remedy for the applicant could have been to have contacted the, the social media platform and asked them to remove it. The court said that's not going to be practical. By the time, firstly, to locate the social media uh, service provider, first, it could be in another jurisdiction. It could take a long time. And this is a far more practicable and responsible remedy because not only will you get an order preventing or, or compelling the respondent to remove this post, but you'll also get an order uh, prohibiting that person from publishing further such posts. Um, there's another piece of legislation, which I've just, another case, which I've just included. Um, here the courts, it's the matter of Rhodes University versus the SRC of Rhodes University. Here, th this was a case concerning uh, the right to protest and freedom of assembly. And, and speaking specifically in regard to freedom of speech, the court pointed out again that the right of freedom of expression does not extend to the advocacy of hatred. It reinforces forces uh, issues that we've discussed already. Um, there's an interesting case um, on, it's called it's Hanukkah versus one and only Cape Town. It's a decision of the CCMA. And, and the benefit of this case, and the reason we included it in here is to highlight the fact that, look, we are balancing constitutional rights and you don't, and an employer or an organization doesn't have ready-made rules to deal with social, it doesn't regulate it more expressly and directly. Yes, an employer can take disciplinary action, can dismiss an employee based upon certain common law and constitutional rights, but inevitably what you're going to have is that balancing exercise and things tend to get a little bit complicated. It's far more, it's far more expedient and and less time consuming and perhaps, perhaps some place it would place the employer on safer ground if the employer has a policy in place or rules in place which prohibit certain conduct. And where that happens, as we saw in this case, um, where an employee posted derogatory comments about, about a manager on Facebook, 
that employee once again, as we've come to expect, ex um, as we've come to expect, raised the defence of freedom of expression. The CCMA said, look, we don't even need to go there because there was a clear rule in place in the employer's organisation, and that rule was violated. And on that basis, I don't need to go beyond that. And and oh, and on that basis, um, the, the the CCMA found in favour of the employer. Um, Cases are not always cut and dry. Sometimes posts may seem innocuous, but have devastating consequences. There's the case of, uh, some of you may be familiar because it's garnered a, a lot of public attention at the moment, the case of Gina Carano, who was fired from uh, a particular TV show because of her tweets. Now, the backstory to, to Gina Carano is that, is that, you know, she's a public figure. She started a career in sports and she moved into entertainment in the form of acting. Um, and, you know, in the middle of 2020, she was uh, egged on by uh, the Black Lives Matter's uh, support base, who wanted her to take a firm stance in support of Black Lives Matter. She didn't do so. She sidestepped the issue. Then you, you had the, you know, the social justice warriors and the, and the people advocating for change uh, and advocating against transphobia, wanted her to take a stance on this and asked her to 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 include in her in her bio her preferred pronouns. Uh, she was quite flippant in her response. She 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 tweeted something like um, her pronouns will be beep, bop and boop. Um, and that was met with disdain by, 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 by activists. Um, so, so you can immediately see she was she was so sort of kind of taking a, a somewhat conservative stance on, on issues. And that, that kind of slid by. But then things came to, to, to a head uh, earlier this year when, when she likened the persecution that is being faced by people who are not in the mainstream media within the US, which are generally the, the, the Republicans, to having their views squashed, and she likened them really to, to effectively Jewish people within uh, Nazi Germany. And she was accused of being consensitive and, 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 all, and, and, and sowing division and so forth. And she was fired from her position. Now, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with, with Karana and, and her tweets, and of course the right to political expression and so forth, there is a reality within which we're constrained. And the reality is that you have a business or you are part of a business and if if one of your stakeholders be an employee be it an employee an independent contractor makes certain postings and there's backlash and this ties in very much with the cancel culture phenomenon which which Carl has mentioned the reality is that the that that the organization is going to be placed under a lot of pressure to deal with that in one way or another. And what we're finding, rightly or wrongly, is that a lot of people, what they're doing is that they're succumbing, a lot of organizations are succumbing to that pressure, often because they feel that they have no choice to do so, and they are terminating relationships with people. Um, I'm going to return to this. It's opportune to have mentioned this now. It's op I will return to this when dealing and providing some advice on how an employer should develop an overall strategy towards dealing with, with these types of tweets in, in the workplace. Um, and with that in mind, I'm going to hand over again to Carl, again to this background, this legal background in mind, I'm going to hand over to Carl once again just to unpack these defences for you more fully so that you'll have a better understanding of, of you know, an employee's rights, whether you're an employee or an employer's rights. If you're an employer, you would, it's important to understand that as well. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. And I'm back. So one of the defenses that has been raised in the past, and we've seen it not only in social media contexts, but in other contexts, um, in the physical world, and that's where there's misconduct outside the workplace. Um, often where an employee finds themselves in a situation where they posted something after hours outside the workplace, what they consider to be their private time, they think they are immune um, from any consequences that may eventuate. Um, and the test is not whether something was done in your private time. 
The test is whether the conduct may adversely affect the employment relationship, not whether it occurred at the workplace or during working hours. While that may assist in the endeavour, it's really how that impacts upon the employment relationship. An example of this comes in the form of the EdCon judgment. Um, so here, what happened was there was an employee of the EdCon group, uh, and she had associated herself as such on the, the fa her own uh, private Facebook page. And at some point, she denigrated the then president, Jacob uh, Zuma, um, uh, using the word monkey as a descriptor, which we know uh, in, in times has become a racially charged word. Um, but, but but she had a, a broader Facebook quote, which we need not delve into here. Um, suffice it to state that uh, she used a derogatory and, and a racial slur. Uh, and this post attracted much attention. At the time, she thought, well, I was just sending it privately, um, and it was on my private page. Uh, but that got out, and it, it, it fell well within the public domain. Um, and she was ultimately called to a disciplinary hearing and she was dismissed. And she referred the matter to the CCMA and ultimately the matter ended up in the Labour Court. And one of the defences that was raised by um, Cantor Mesa was, well, you know, this post happened outside of working hours. Uh, it, it happened um, during my, my personal time, my personal capacity. I, I did not uh, associate myself with um, my employer. And the employer said, no, 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 or the, the court said, no, 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 and it aligned itself with the employer's view that she had in fact associated herself uh, on a Facebook page with the employer because it referenced that she was employed by EdCon. Um, and ultimately, they looked at the, uh, the, the fact that that public behavior impacted upon uh, the employment relationship uh, and also brought EdCon into a disrepute. And for that reason, they found that the dismissal was fair. And another important point, and it's something that Sandro did go into quite some detail in his, uh, present, uh, his part of the presentation, is that the constitutional pre protection um, is not afforded to hate speech. And the use of, the use of a racial slur falls within that uh, category. And another case where this uh, you know, um, misconduct outside the um, the workplace uh, took place was an employee who watched a, a man beating a woman at KFC uh, during the course of Women's Month. And he posted a, a derogatory post and it reads, kill the boer. We need to kill these racists that are beating women in Women's Month. This happened outside the workplace and outside of working hours. However, the employee was deployed by his employer at one of his client's premises, and he had associated himself on his Facebook account with the clients of that employer. And the employer didn't immediately come to realize that this post had taken place, but it was in fact the client that brought it to the attention of the employer uh, and, and informed the employer that their employee had uh, made a discriminatory post. And ultimately, the employee tried to argue that he wasn't being racist by using the phrase Boer, but instead he was referring to a system of oppression. But the CCMA uh, presiding arbitrator didn't agree with that view and found that he was being derogatory. And the fact that, as we've seen in the EdCon case, the misconduct took place outside uh, of the workplace and off duty is neither here nor there. It still impacted upon uh, the employment relationship and that employees continued suitability for employment. And in those circumstances, the presiding commissioner found that the dismissal was fair. There's a, quite a recent case at the CCMA um, where an employee uh, was, uh, occurred during the lockdown, the hard lockdown, and there was a bit of uncertainty about what should be happening in the, the workplace, and I think everyone will, will remember that uncertainty. And the employer initially had said to the uh, its employees, well, look, you guys can all go home. We're going to be in a hard lockdown. Um, but once everyone had been sent away to go home, the employer realized that it could fall within the category of essential services. And as a result of that, it said, well, look, all employee, employees should return to work uh, under the category of essential services with the necessary permits. 
And one of the staff members here, the employee, had received leave uh, to a, a, attend uh, a, a traditional gathering uh, of sorts. And there was a bit of a back and forth now because between the employee and the employer, because he was now instructed to come back to work um, under the guise of an essential service. And the employer wasn't willing to fund travel at this point in time. And he was told that if he didn't return to work, um, he would be he, he would have to take annual leave um, or in, if, if he did not, unpaid leave would apply based on the principle of no work, no pay. And this led to a bit of frustration on the part of the employee and he tweeted out to the president and SAPS to say that the employer was forcing employ, employees to return to work and if they didn't, they would be compelled to take annual leave. Um, and the employee felt that this was a form of misconduct and dismissed the employee. And then the dispute ended up before the CCMA. And the CCMA commissioner took a bit more of a, a different view. And he recognized that while we're in unprecedented times during the lockdown, he looked at the tweet uh, itself and said, well, is there anything particularly wrong with this tweet? Um, you know, this tweet is up for for two days, and I'll just take a step back there. And he was uh, asked to take it down, and he ultimately did so. And he said, "Well, look, it was just for two for two hours, if I'm not mistaken." He did take it down, and there was a hint of truth to the tweet. Um, the actual words used by the employer in its message to the employee um, might not have been reflected in the tweet, but there was a hint of truth of it, and. Admittedly, reading the decision uh, in, in that case, the arbitrator wasn't quite clear on what form of misconduct he considered this to be on the part of the employee, but he did uh, consider there to be some misconduct. And considering the, the context, he said, well, a dismissal is not an appropriate sanction here, and rather that should be replaced with a final written warning. But the principle to extract from this case is that context, as we mentioned earlier, um, and particularly with reference to the, in answer to the question on the Harvard University incident, context is everything. And as Sandra alluded to, the right to privacy is something that is often brought up in cases as a defense. In these two CCMA cases, uh, Fredericks and Sedek, there were employees who published derogatory statements on their Facebook page, which con uh, concerned their superiors. And there was information that was uplifted from those uh, Facebook pages that they said infringed their constitutional right to privacy. And the CCMA, and they were ultimately dismissed. And, and this, this argument featured again at the CCMA, and they said, well, you know, my, my Facebook is my private space. Um, but in publishing these posts, it did go to subordinates of the company, and the CCMA recognized that you, there is always the possibility that it reaches clients um, and uh, and service providers and the like. And they looked at the Facebook page and they said, well, what you say in Facebook, is it really private? It's more of a public domain and many people have access to it. Um, so there wasn't in this case infringement of privacy that, that took place. And they cautioned, uh, in, in, and it is a cautionary tale for uh, employees who like to vent and, and air issues on their, their Facebook pages, that it's not the right place or the correct platform to address concerns, but those should rather be raised through, for example, the grievance procedure. Similarly, there was also the, another matter that served before the CCMA, where an employee was dissatisfied with the restructuring process that took place at his employer. And he aired some complaints on his uh, a, a derogatory uh, comments and the like on a Facebook page after the restructuring process had commenced. And he stated, well, again, it's my private communication because it's it's my Facebook page. And I'm saying it to um, the crowd on my Facebook that I want to say this to. And that didn't fly. The CCMA commissioner again referred to the cases that we just mentioned of Frederick, um, uh, Fredericks and Sedek. And there, an important quote that uh, emanates from that judgment is as follows. 
These awards suggest that dismissal for critical comments placed on Facebook will be found to be fair. A, where an employee fails to restrict access to the site. B, where the posting brings the employee into disrepute. And C, where the posting leads to the working relationship becoming intolerable, which is the high watermark uh, test, really, uh, in uh, where an employment relationship is broken down. Um, and those comments were in, in, in any event, <coughs> hold that, uh, it was held that there was no invasion of privacy there. And the, the employees weren't using any privacy options on Facebook with an implication that em emanates from that, that the employer uh, should not intrude if privacy options are used. However, postings are defamatory and it comes into the possession of the employer that by legitimate means, there is always the risk, and it was highlighted in this CCMA decision, the employer may proceed with a def defamation claim um, and also disciplinary proceedings. So it is something to note that comments go out into the public domain, and, and once you think, and even if you think something is private, if it does get out, there is always the risk uh, that action may be taken. But what about privacy? And, and here is quite an interesting uh, case. And it, the question about privacy in this case concerns, well, what happens if evidence uh, is obtained by not, uh, by, not by legitimate means? Here, there were two uh, colleagues that worked together and they were members of a close corporation, Harvey and Ireland. Harvey had suspicions that Nyland was going, uh, who had subsequently left the closed corporation, that Nyland was going and soliciting clients and taking business away from the closed corporation. But he didn't have a shred of evidence to, to demonstrate this. Um, and he was constrained in his ability to approach a court for some relief. It ultimately came to him that he, ha he got the password for Nyland's Facebook page went onto that Facebook page and he found various correspondence and postings and it transpired that uh, Nyland was in fact soliciting the clients away from the closed corporation. And there, and, and, and there you would imagine that, that Harvey was concerned because he had legitimate uh, interests and rights that he wanted to protect of his closed corporation. Um, and bearing in mind that in this Harvey case, uh, an Nyland case, there was complaints and a concern that Nyland was breaching his fiduciary's owed, fiduciary duties that were owed to the closed corporation. Um, because as many of you may know, even once uh, you leave the employee of a company or you stop serving as a director, fiduciary duties still uh, prevail and you owe fiduciary duties. And ultimately in the Harvey vs. Nyland case, the court considered the right to privacy and, and said, well, it's not an absolute right. And we may use evidence that is obtained by illegitimate means, but we must exercise our discretion in doing so. And the fact that Nyland had at, at all times maintained the view that he was doing nothing wrong, but it transpired, despite it being through illegitimate means, that he was doing something wrong, the court found his conduct to be duplicitous. And said in those circumstances, society couldn't find it acceptable that someone would lie and um, benefit from that uh, in essence. And that evidence was uh, was used. And another case that, that Sandra also alluded to earlier as a form of defense is where grievances are aired, uh, aired on social media. And the view is taken that, well, it's a protective disclosure. I was blowing the whistle on irregularities uh, within the workplace. And a case in point concerns Bahrain versus Martin. And here, there was an employee of Grutuskir Hospital, and he had raised various complaints before concerning health hazards, hazards at the hospital. Um, and one of those complaints concerned that there was uh, ablution facilities that weren't um, properly functional, that were dirty, um, and there was what he termed dirty air being uh, passed through the air vents of the, the hospital and making patients ill. And he went and posted that on Facebook and um, there came to the employer's attention that these posts were out there and the employer instructed him on several occasions to remove those posts, but instead 
he didn't remove him and rather perpetuated his um, postings and, and posted uh, further posts and complaints and issues. And ultimately, he was called to a disciplinary hearing um, and he was charged with gross insubordination um, and being his failure to follow the instructions of the employer. And he raised this defense that well, it was a protected disclosure. And that didn't fly during the, the disciplinary hearing and ultimately at the labor court. Um, because he, he did raise, and you may be aware, that if you're dismissed for protective disclosure, that can constitute an automatically unfair dismissal um, and can increase the compensation that may be awarded for an unlawful dismissal. And the Labour Court found that his conduct wasn't reasonable um, and it, it didn't amount to protect disclosure that would be protected by the Protected Disclosures Act. Uh, the employee was aware that the employer had given a response on the issues and had adequately addressed the issues, which made his, uh, his disclosure unreasonable. And he also didn't go about making a disclosure in a responsible manner. He didn't follow the procedures for the, for the, of the whistleblowing policy and instead took it upon himself to post comments on Facebook without also affording the employer to comment or give its side of the story. Because there's no editorial policies on Facebook. Um, so it's something to bear in mind that whistleblowing is not necessarily going to save you unless you comply with the appropriate procedure. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Sandra again. <clears throat> Thanks, Carl. So, so what you would have observed um, from all that we've discussed, I would hope, is that is that employees land up getting themselves into a lot of trouble if they post on social media, uh, if they post in an unlawful way or in a way which, which violates the rights of others. What we've also seen is that an employer can, or an organization, can suffer untold harm to its reputation and its brand if postings are made about, of and concerning it. You know, I'll harken back to, I'll harken back to the Theresa May scandal. We've we've seen in, in the post of um, we've seen in, in the other examples which we've mentioned that the the organisation itself finds themselves under pressure and they need to act quickly. Often, what this means is that is that they may themselves feel the need to take actions against their employees because their employees have acted wrongfully and this is, cannot be sanctioned or tolerated. So they would want to take disciplinary action against them with the view to dismissing them. They may want to terminate relationships with independent contractors or third parties or other stakeholders. Um, and they may find themselves, in addition to all of that, you know, being 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 the target of some kind of orchestrated campaign against them. Now, now, one can't really unring that bell and the damage to sales, reputation, and I would imagine that that you know the primary aim of an employer is not to dismiss its employees. Instead, the best thing to happen would be you know it would be an employer's best interest that its employees effectively toe the line and behave themselves and post, use social media in a responsible way. Um, and, and with this in mind, the, the most organizations, well, organizations need to develop an overall strategy towards dealing with, with um, social media. And the starting point is, is, you know, if we can prevent these posts, these irresponsible posts from being made in the first place, that's 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 a victory in and of itself. Then you don't have to worry about um, you know containing reputation in the workplace. You don't have to worry about dismissing people. And the overall strategy commences at the outset with developing a social media policy. It is without I cannot stress this enough. It is absolutely critical that every organisation has a social media policy, and the reason for that I hope by now is fairly obvious. The primary aim of a social media policy is to educate. In my experience, most social media users are simply unaware of the extensive ramifications that may take place in as a result of their postings. So if, if your primary aim is to, to educate, um, 
this can and should be achieved through a social media policy. In addition, as, as I've mentioned earlier on, it sets up the rules of engagement. So if an employee breaches the terms of the social media policy, um, one need not get into the realm of freedom of expression and human dignity and all of that, which which all may feature and they have the proper place and context. But you could you could address it in perhaps a, a far more you can address these issues in perhaps a far more direct and unemotive way, simply by by referring to the rules that have been breached. So you'll what what we thought would be useful for you would be just to to draw from one of our clients, which is a university, and they've got a very good social media policy in place. We thought it might be useful for you just to draw, just to highlight certain aspects of this policy, which which is something which most organ which every organisation should have, and which I think brings together all the learning that you you hopefully would have received from this presentation. So firstly, the, the, the ambit of the policy should be wide and include all stakeholders. In the case of this university, you'll see that we that what we've included are, are also officials and persons who hold special appointments and alumni um, and associates who use social media. Um, it speaks about, you know, in, in the case of a university, students um, are also uh, key stakeholders and this policy must apply to them. In your organisation, you might want to consider, you know, to what extent you, you can and should um, broaden it. Most importantly, the idea is to educate for these, for the reasons which I've mentioned. And they should, you know, stakeholders should be told that, you know, there may be a wide circulation of their social media postings, often without even their knowledge or consent. They should be no, they should be made be made aware um, that you know they that they leave a footprint, a digital footprint, which could come back and haunt them at any stage. Um, they should also be reminded that the conduct across the board, which but which is not limited to social media, is asset, is assessed against the organisation's values and other rules. So this would be an opportune place for any organisation to speak about uh, the constitution, as we've seen. Uh, this university has done, the organization's vision, mission, values and strategic objectives. Um, any codes of conduct that may already be in place, such as rules, um, could be referenced and brought into the policy. And um, it could also, and it should also be expressly brought to their attention that, you know, there is a policy on whistleblowing. And if you want to blow the whistle or make a protective disclosure, again, gear them towards or direct them towards the provision of a policy. Because, you know, as, as I've mentioned, you know, it, it doesn't really help an organization at the end of the day to try to do damage control after, a, after you know, the, the shortcomings of the organization are displayed on social media for all and sundry to comment on. One would much rather avoid that, have the employee utilize the whistleblowing procedures and then that that issue could be dealt with in its ordinary course. The other benefit, of course, is that an employee could hardly come and argue that he or she was blowing the whistle when there are policies in place which expressly say, do not use social media to purport to blow the whistle, direct your attention elsewhere or direct your efforts elsewhere. Um, a policy should, a good social media policy should also caution stakeholders that the right to freedom of speech is not absolute. And, and I say this because a lot of people in my experience who we've dealt with, either you know people who we are prosecuting in disciplinary inquiries and in arbitrations, they simply didn't know this. Um, so it's important to, to, to set that out for them. One should also remind employees of the certain common law obligations, uh, which we've mentioned and how these common law obligations limit their rights to freedom of expression or freedom of speech. And I've given you some examples of what is contained in this policy on how one can go about doing that. Um, I'll just take you through a few. You know, you, you, you point out that all employees owe the duty of utmost good faith, etc. It's, it's useful to list these in the policies because, you know, us lawyers tend to forget sometimes that common law obligations are something that is not necessarily at the forefront of individuals' minds. And a lot of employees 
you know, perhaps less so than directors, forget that they have common law obligations, which very, some of which survive the termination of the employment relationship. So it's useful to mention that in the policy. Uh, they should be cautioned that, you know, that even their private posts outside of the workplace may impact their relationship with the organization. And they should be educated on what that means and how it can be addressed. So here in this particular social media policy, it stated that it expressly employees should be aware that the lines between professional social media persona and private or personal social media uh, persona have become blurred. Um, and then it goes on to set out that despite this blurred distinction, or perhaps rather because of the blurred distinction, just be aware that if what you post online impacts us as an employer, we can and will take action to protect our rights. It's useful to provide in your social media policy certain examples for clarification. Uh, that's what this policy does. Um, special mention should be made of trademarks. You know, if you want to protect them. So here in this policy, it says no person may use the university's brand, uh, which includes its logo, slogans, corporate colors, etc., uh, unless prior written consent has been obtained from from X. Um, again, a lot of people just are, a lot of employees are simply unaware of these obligations. Um, what are we? What you often see um, is is in, in social media activity, you'll, you'll find that there'll be certain disclaimers and employees seem to think that by, by saying, look, the views expressed, you know, by me in my social media are mine alone, they're not my employers and so forth. And they, and they often operate under a misguided assumption that that protects them. Uh, the truth of the matter is it doesn't. The disclaimer may go some way to protecting them from dismissal and so forth. Um, but it, it, I've yet to see it reach the point where it actually shields them completely from it. Um, and, and the reason for that is obvious. You know, if I put in a disclaimer saying these are my opinions and not necessarily the opinions of my firm, but I go ahead and I, I in, my, in, in, my, in my, my personal profile, it's clear that I'm a director of this firm. It's also clear that I'm making very racist, hurtful, derogatory statements of others. My mere disclaimer does not protect my firm from the damage that's being done in the eyes of the public to what my firm is, what it stands for and who it employs. And that's why it's useful to provide guidance in your social media policy on disclaimers. In this uh, university, what they say is, you know, these disclaimers, such as these are my personal views, etc., you know, may where appropriate be considered to be a mitigating factor but do not necessarily put an expression beyond the sufficient and legitimate interest of the university, and that is necessarily so. What a mitigating factor means is that if an employee is found to have committed some form of misconduct uh, before they are dismissed or any sanction is applied, a, uh, a, a disciplinary panel will consider whether there are any mitigating factors, you know, such as whether they've shown remorse. And one of these factors may be, look, they did put a disclaimer, but as I said, that doesn't, it, it's, that doesn't mean that they will be shielded from the possibility of dismissal. I think it's very worthwhile and prudent to include in a social media uh, policy that, you know, breaches of the policy could lead to dismissal or in the case of students exclusion. You know, uh, if you're dealing with if you're dealing with independent contractors or other stakeholders, you may want to include, you know, wording such as this in your contracts with these parties, you know, to say whilst whilst we don't regulate necessarily what you do on your own time, if you publish in, in social media anything which could we consider to be derogatory, hurtful, hate speech or impact us, that could constitute a material breach of that agreement. So this type of verbiage would, I think, be well placed in the social media policy, but it could also be adapted to be placed in contracts with third parties. Um, what is also useful is to place a, a general duty on employees to report any breach of the policy. This is not an obligation that's that's not without controversy. Um, a lot of employees take the view and, and others that look, I, I shouldn't be a policeman and have to report on, on the conduct of my colleagues. Um, 
but to that, I mean, you know, there's no right or wrong answer to that. I, however, can see a legitimate reason for imposing such an obligation on employees, which which you can do if, if you want to. Um, um, the, the rationale being that social media poses such a massive threat to the organization. If a, an infringement of social media comes to somebody's attention that impacts your employer, remember, you as an employee have a common law obligation to act at all times in the best interests of your employer in good faith and 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 to to do all within your power to protect the employer and that may well be bringing to the employer's attention information which could potentially harm the employer to enable the employer to to address that um, a good social media policy should also include a mechanism by which assistance can be provided to, to uh, social media users in a clear manner. Often people will be uncertain whether they can or cannot do something, you know, whether what they intend posting um, could constitute any violation. And it's useful to create a mechanism by which they can escalate that concern to a responsible and knowledgeable person within the organization who could provide the necessary guidance. We find that that helps quite, quite significantly. Um, what a lot of organisations, you know, you know, perhaps in fairness, a lot of the a lot of the the, the not so big organisations um, take the view that um, don't necessarily have a mechanism in place or, or a designated person in order to publish. On social media on behalf of the company and that can we see lead to difficulties and concerns you know if, if somebody is is not schooled in in the wide impact of social media and doesn't necess isn't necessarily aware of the of, of the company's objectives but seeks merely to report on social media on a particular course that's being run or a particular product you know, it's 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 it, it is potentially a recipe for disaster because that person may inadvertently step out of line or do something which, despite the best of intentions, may cause harm to the employer. So it's useful, if you can, to designate somebody as being the person responsible to post on social media any and all official information about the organisation. Um, the employer should take it upon itself to continuously monitor. Uh, social media, the way the policy is being implemented, and it should take action in, in, in terms of it. You know, if if an employer, as a general rule, implements, you know, as a general principle, if an employer implements a rule, and that rule is frequently breached without incidents and without any repercussion, the employer would be very hard pressed to seek to enforce that rule at a later stage because an employer has a duty to be fair and consistent. So, you know, if you are going to be taking social media seriously, as as I suggest you do, it, it does require a fair amount of monitoring and it does require consistent and fair application going forward. And then, you know, social media policy should, like all policies, should be reviewed. Um, I want to talk to you, um, um, this kind of case, appears somewhat out of nowhere and it's probably not placed in the correct context within the broader scheme of this presentation but it is useful to, to, to put in here at this at this juncture it's it's the case dealing with a departing employee and i'm sure most of you have had cases where either you have left an organization or one of your employees has left your organization and the question that arises is is you know um can you compel them to remove or at least make a remove from their social media profiles the fact that they are your current employee or, or can you at least make it clear that can you get them to make it clear that whilst they may have been employed with you at some time and, and, and no one can have a qualm with recording one's history they are no longer actively associated with you and um this case is evidence for the fact that you can you know if an employee a former employee refuses to to remove uh, their links, then, then, then you can take steps and approach the court for assistance. And that's what this case is authority for. Um, 
So with that in mind, and with this entire background in mind, I'd like to give you a high-level overview on dealing with social media threats. And this, of course, is pulling in together all of the information that, that we've shared with you during the course of, of today and, and which we hope you find useful. Um, we're often called upon to, to advise our clients and to provide them with some, in, some insights on, on what they can do. The problem is that we're often called in a little late in the day. We're called in when an organization is facing social scrutiny, where somebody within the organization is, is, has fallen victim to cancel culture. The employer does not necessarily want to lose that person. You know, they see two sides to every story. Their employee is an asset to the organization. Um, but at the same, by the same token, the products are being boycotted and so forth. And, and whilst we can manage that, our advice to, to, to all organizations is, 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 it, is far more, it is far more preferable to take a proactive approach and cater to, to what, is with, what is more likely than not to be a certainty in your organization's horizon. This will happen. Uh, it's, I don't mean to sound overly pessimistic, but it, it will happen. And what you're likely to face are, are postings by disgruntled employees, by disgruntled consumers, sometimes anonymously by competitors that might be malicious, that might be, you know, innocent, but plain stupid. You are going to find yourselves in the situation and it's always preferable to be ready for it for when it arises. So prevention is better than cure. We've already pointed out that you should develop a social media policy and you should ensure that that social media policy is widely circulated and employees within your organization are educated on the social media policy. What's proven to be quite helpful is where employers run certain campaigns on aspects of the policy, such as a think before you post campaign, which, which I think would go down well in any organization. Um, you might want to consider in, you know, a good pop, an overall strategy towards prevention is including within contracts of employment um, important issues which 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 and important uh, concerns that you have with social media postings, perhaps highlight or perhaps draw their attention to the social media policy in the contract of employment, perhaps record in the contract of, of employment their, their common law fiduciary obligations, record as well perhaps, and, and you know, get them to agree in their contract of employment that on termination of employment, they, they, under, they irrevocably undertake and agree to remove all references in social media towards their their um, towards all references in social media to to their current employer, or and to make it very clear that they're no longer an employee or associated with the organisation. It's also, although the common law prohibits um, an employee from disclosing confidential information of the employer even after his or her employment, again, a lot of employees don't know this. Um, and it's always better to include it in a contract. So now you're not just running, you know, if you need to enforce that obligation, you wouldn't simply be running off a confidential, a common law obligation. You would also be suing on a contractual right. So include in the contract of employment that an employee shall not comment on the, in the press or otherwise during his employment or her employment or afterwards on any of the client's customers or any confidential information. Bear this in mind when you're constructing your employment contracts. We can we can go to town on this. I'm just giving you a high level overview. Prepare for the crisis because you know, as, whilst I don't want to sound like a prophet of doom, the the crisis will come. And in our experience, um, the best way to prepare for the crisis, and and by the crisis, what I mean perhaps more specifically is is that there will be a post. You will be scrambling to deal with it. You might have clients to appear, someone to fire, evidence to be gained. If, if, you, if you've given forethought as to, you know, who should be responsible for it, you know, which attorneys are we likely to use? Because often you need advice right off the cuff. Um, what letters should go out? Should we issue holding letters? All of these things should be pre-thought out. And, and, and what we've advised and quite successfully clients, various clients on, is to provide pre prepare a social media crisis handbook. And it kind of provides flowcharts setting out how, how, how threats are dealt with. A very important starting point is, you know, I, I think the, 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 
such a such a manual, I think, really provides calm, calmness to people, a sense of direction um, in circumstances where very often they'd be prone to act swiftly uh, without guidance and, and often they'd fumble away. So that the starting point would be to identify a committee, identify responsible persons, and then compile your manual. And in that manual, you, as I said, you'd, you'd include certain flowcharts of, 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 how, of how you would deal with it. And, and what that flowchart really does, it would, it would distinguish between, you know, where is the threat, threat coming from? Is it an employee? Is it an ex-employee? Is it an anonymous employee? How do we go about compiling a dossier or a file of evidence, which will be necessary if you're going to be taking disciplinary action or if you're going to be approaching the High Court for an interdict, or if perhaps you're going to have to approach the service provider itself in order to, to try to have them um, remove the post using their own takedown notification procedures. It's useful to include in the manual um, the, the procedures of the well-known known, uh, social media platforms in order to have posts that are taken down. So the crisis manual should be, should be developed. Um, I'd like to conclude by giving you an overview on, on, on how an organization could deal with social media threats. I just want to get a, a, a printed copy of the slide because it's very, very small. And I apologize for that, but I'm told that as it presents to you across your screens, it's not that small. I, I hope that's right. So what's what's very important is as a you know so there's the preventative measures which i've just described consisting of having a social media policy educating establishing a crisis committee having a crisis manual but now the threat has arisen what do you do and and, and i don't intend setting out for you precisely all the steps that you can take but i'd like to highlight for you the importance of gathering evidence and the broad overview of some of the steps that you can take which obviously can be tailor-made to your you know to, to your specific circumstances. So very importantly, it must start by gather, gathering evidence and you need to designate a responsible person to gather that evidence. And this would be about, you know, establishing to what extent, um, you know, who is the perpetrator, who is the person um, sending, sending uh, information publishing information on social media. Does this, it's useful to go into this person's media history to see if there are others. And then once the, the you know, you're busy compiling information and compiling a dossier, it's useful to continue to check that person's social media um, accounts to establish whether those postings continue. Um, once you've gathered all of that information and you know who you're dealing with, you know, very often it, 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 the situation can be addressed by having a discussion with the person and asking the, 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 the person to remove the post. Um, and, and we've seen the success, this be, be, be handled successfully in the past. I mean, Carl mentioned the case where the employer told the employee, please remove your post. It was removed after two hours, which is great because it, it minimizes the extent of the publication and the reputational harm. If, you know, that also consider whether a holding statement or tempered communication needs to be addressed. Sometimes you would need to have um, a holding statement published on social media Sometimes you might need to address if your client is being implicated or another stakeholder, you might need to notify them. It's useful to have, you know, pre-prepared guiding, you know, template letters and so forth that can be used. Um, but, but, but often through a discussion, a sensible discussion, the employee or, the, or, or, or somebody else, you know, uh, who's in the process of defaming you might, might take it down through, through a very informal discussion. Where that doesn't, arise, then it's you, what you may need to do, if you look at the action on the far far right of the page, you might need to get your lawyers to send a letter of demand, instructing them or demanding that they remove the, the, the post and that they cease and desist in such further conduct, failing which you may apply to court for an interdict to compel them to comply with your demands. And that should also be threatened that you will hold them liable for, for, for any damages which you as a business have sustained as a result of their conduct. Um, but depend, you know, the, the type of remedy that you may need to, to embark upon, that's a civil remedy. Another remedy may be 
to report the matter to the police. Now, you would only report the matter to the police if the threat or the postings constitutes a crime or a threat that a crime will be committed. And that's why if we look at our first um, um, column of colored blocks, you, it's, it's very important to understand immediately or to understand as quickly as possible what are you seeking to protect? Are you seeking to protect the premises of the business or the people or the reputation? More often than not, it will be the reputation. Very often, so, so more often than not, it will be the reputation, but sometimes it will cover all, all three of these or just two of them. And, and, you know, and then you should ask yourself from what? From, from what am I protecting? And we've given you some examples. Uh, the next step in guiding you would be to assess whether it's a criminal matter or not. If it's a criminal matter, report the matter to the police. Ask them to take action. One of the drawbacks you will see when we follow the, the reporting line is that our police are notoriously slow to act. But there are mechanisms by which, by which even after reporting the matter to the police, if the police have no intention of prosecuting the matter, there is a mechanism by which um, you could obtain a certificate from the police indicating that they look, they're dragging their feet, they have no intention of prosecuting. And if you feel strong about it, you could step into the shoes of the prosecutor and prosecute. So there's that measure. But also it's useful, important, it's useful to keep a record. And I'm not saying the police will not always act. I'm just saying be aware that one of the drawbacks, you know, I, I would not be comfortable in saying report the matter to the police and leave it at that. I my recommendation to clients is, is that if you're wanting to to protect your, your reputation, if you're wanting to protect others, absolutely report it to the police, but also take certain proact ste proactive steps. And these steps are outlined here. Some of your more common steps would be letters of demand, applications to court for interdicts. Um, we mentioned the Anton Piller procedure. Now, the Anton Piller procedure, for those of you who are not aware, is a procedure that's available to try to obtain evidence where you have none. So provided you can you can demonstrate good cause why you believe X is behind certain postings, you what the Anton Pillar procedure entitles one to do is to approach the High Court for an interdict or for an answer, what is known as an Anton Pillar order. And that allows effectively a, a search warrant to be issued and to be executed at the premises of the person who is reasonably suspected of doing something. And, and to gather evidence. It's, 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 a, it's a difficult order to obtain, but it is a mechanism available to you should you feel the need to obtain evidence. Um, so with all of that background in mind, um, and, and with all of that, um, all of everything that we've presented, we'd just like to make some concluding remarks. You know, and, and, and at the risk of repetition, Social media impacts your business. There's no question it impacts you as individuals and it impacts your employees. Not all businesses have social media policies and we strongly encourage you to develop one. We also strongly encourage you to develop a crisis manual we develop and to at least give some forethought into how you will attend to this crisis if and when it arises. And um, a strategy on the books of, of all you know, all, all responsible organizations, in our opinion, should have a strategy towards dealing with, with social media. And we, we are hopeful that we have provided you with some tools and, and some food for thought towards, in the first instance, appreciating the need to develop such a strategy. And secondly, you know, the impetus to go out and act upon it. Um, we, we will check now to see if there are any questions that have come in that we can hopefully address in the seven or so minutes that we have available. And I do reiterate that these slides will, we have um, spoken with W Consulting and they will disseminate the slides. And of course, it goes without saying, if, if anybody has any questions, you know, that, that they wish to raise with us, they're more than welcome to. So with that in mind, I'm going to attempt to see if I can see whether any questions Oh yeah, do you want to help me? Yeah, I don't think that's that. Sorry, uh, I'm not sure. 
I don't think it's that. Sorry, guys, this is a technical issue. Uh, sorry, I seem to have clicked something that I shouldn't have clicked, and I'm not using my computer. Sorry about that. It looks like I'm not going to get to ask my questions, to answer questions. So we seem to have clicked something which we shouldn't have. Did you leave? No, no, no. I think these are the questions. All right. Just try and get to scroll down. Okay, so a couple of questions. I'm going to try to answer as many as I can. And Carl, you can assist me as well. You can do this jointly. So a few generic questions. Would checking upon an employee's social media, particularly Facebook, would it be that some sort of breach of privacy? Okay, well, I'm going to stop there. The question is, I think to be answered is to what extent has the employee set his or her personal settings to privacy? If it's open to the public, then there's no there can be no breach of privacy. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps a related question, and it may be coming up up later. You know, what you often see, you know, there's a piece of of legislation called the Regulation and Interception of Electronic Communications Act, which which makes it which 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 criminalizes makes it an offense for somebody to intercept somebody else's electronic communications now the question that arises is if you're using a workplace computer or phone to be and your your, your facebook settings are on private and you you're using that to send and receive messages but you're using perhaps the workplace as server to what extent can the workplace regulate, intercept those communications and effectively spy on you, to use it quite colloquially? Um, what we often find is, and, and what most employment contracts have, are certain provisions in terms of which employees consent to the regulation and interception of their electronic communications that are made at the workplace using the workplace equipment. And where that happens, where that consent is given, the employee may do so. The, um, the, the, the more thorny question is, well, what happens if this is not contained in the employment contract and, and no consent has been given? There's a lot of case law which, which stands and which it's still good case law, which suggests that, um, that an employer may still do so because if you're using the tools of the trade of the employer being their computer, their server and so forth, you need to expect and understand that they have an interest in maintaining the flow of traffic on their servers and they would have a right to intercept and, 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 you, and, and view uh, the message that, messages that are there. What will be very interesting to see is, as I'm sure most of you are aware, the Protection of Personal Information Act is, is now, will become more fully effective. I think it's the 1st of July, or is it June? Mm -hmm. I think it's the 1st of July. It would be very interesting to see the interplay and the dynamic there. Carl, is anything you want to add to that? No, I think you've covered it. Um, isn't an employee's, face, an employee's Facebook profile privacy a human? Well, I think we've addressed that. Um, is there a social media policy that could be shared with all PKF firms. I'm sorry, I don't know what PKF stands for. I think that some of the participants. Some of the participants. Well, um, you know, I don't want to punt for work and I don't want to, to tart, but if anybody contacts us, you know, we, we could assist you. What we have provided in the slide and the slide presentation is some key aspects of what could be included in a social media policy. So I'm by no means saying that you have to come to us, you have to go to another lawyer if you want or you can even try your hand at drafting your own social media policy. I think you have been equipped with a lot of the tools, but obviously you, you might want to have it sense checked and tailor-made. Um, 
Would it make it easier if a company doesn't follow an employee social media activity? No, I don't think so. I think that's, you know, with respect, I think that's a bit of an ostrich. What's the phrase? Ostrich in the ostrich's head in the sand mentality. Yeah. I think I would rather, as an organisation, I would rather know that somebody is 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 posting um, um, about about my organisation so that I can implement steps to address it. I think we have provided. The next question was, uh, what steps can a company take to safeguard itself against ex-employees? A very interesting point. Um, I have mentioned, you know, touched on it um, in the presentation. I would say the best thing to do is to ensure that your contracts of employment contain sufficient protection to the employer for events post termination of employment. So there are certain obligations you can agree upon that will survive the termination of the employment relationship. And then monitor every now and again, check in with your clients. Is this ex employee poaching them? Is he bad mouthing you? Is this ex monitor this ex employee social media activities? And the moment the ex employee steps out of line, approach your lawyers and take immediate action against this person. Just read that and address that if you can. So the question here is Is an employer or potential employer allowed to request access to a candidate's social media to assess that candidate's suitability for a position? Well, in the first instance, there's no problem with making a request uh, for this information. And if that information is open publicly, an employer or potential employer would be able to obtain access to that in any event. The next question is, can an existing employer demand access to an existing employee's social media? If, yeah, I don't think so. If the, I think they can demand it. Yeah. I don't think the employee need to comply. The, it, it, yeah, and uh, I, I think to put it differently as Sandra was saying is that they wouldn't have a right to it. Mm. Um, and, and this is where the competing interests come in. Um, but if information does come to an employer's attention, oh, well, that might put the employer in a different position. But as a matter of right to demand it, not so much. Those are all the questions. I'm, I'm pleased that we managed to do it. Thank you all for participating in the presentation. We truly hope that you enjoyed it. And I'd like to say I hope to see you soon, but I haven't seen any of you, but it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank everyone. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.